Bible Prophecy Conference. This is our 15th conference. And every year we say, Lord, do you want us to have another conference? All right, go for it. And um, so we'll continue to do that until the rapture, which is much sooner. Uh, <laughs> so we're so blessed to have our speakers with us this, this year. And the uh, first that's going to share with us is Dr. Tommy Ice. Uh, Tommy has been with us at all of our Bible conferences, except maybe a couple. And uh, she, he and Janice uh, live in Illinois now by way of Texas and Kansas. But uh, Dr. Tommy Ice was a former professor and one of the foremost authorities on Bible prophecy. And so we're always just graced to have him here with us. He's a director of the Pre-Trib Research Center, which he co-founded with Dr. Tim LaHaye in 1994, and it's a research to proclaim Bible prophecy with a focus on the pre-tribulational rapture. Tommy has written or co-written over 40, 40 books. In fact, the one I'd like to point out to you, which he's going to kind of focus on, is uh, Zionism, the case for Zionism. And uh, why Christians should support Israel, and if they ever needed a friend, it's 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 today. So he's a, a frequent speaker at Bible conferences and Bible prophecy conferences throughout the the country and and throughout the world. So we're just graced again to have Dr. Ice with us. He and his wife Janice now live in Southern Illinois. And they have three grown sons. So, Dr. Ice, bless you. Thank you for being here again. I thought it was going to push that button. Uh, yeah, this is half off for this uh, price wise. So, uh, we're going to be dealing with uh, what is Christian Zionism because, uh, well, and what is Zionism? A lot of people think it, some people are thrown off by that word or that term, but uh, Zionism is from that Hebrew word Zion and uh it's simply put, Zionism is the desire of the Jewish people to occupy the land of Israel. That's what it uh, refers to. Do you need me to adjust my mic or anything? Okay. And in a book on the history of Zionism, Zionism, according to a recent encyclopedia, is a worldwide political movement launched by Theodore Herzl, in 1897. The Jewish National Revival, which took place in the 19th century, culminating in political Zionism, was preceded uh, by a great many activities and publications, by countless projects, declarations, and meetings. The term Zionism was first used publicly by Nathan Birnbaum at a discussion meeting in Vienna on the evening of uh, 23 January 1892. So the history of political Zionism begins with the publication of Herzl's Judenstadt, which, which uh, was written in uh, German, I believe, meaning the Jewish state, <clears throat> four years later in the first Zionist conference, Congress. But the Zionist idea antedates the name and the organization. So there's Herzl, and uh, he was a secular Jew, and uh, he died early, only age 44, and a lot of people think he burned himself out uh, pushing the Zionist movement. But uh, you, what spurred him is he was from uh, Switzerland, and he was assigned as a newspaper guy to in Paris and it just so happened what's called the Dreyfus Affair occurred. And, uh, and, uh, and he covered it. And that's what really awoken him because you had a, 
um, French officer who was accused of crimes that he didn't do, but it, uh, overall it, it was because he was Jewish, the French officer. And he, he spent 10 years in prison, and they eventually let him out and, real, and announced that they were wrong to have prosecuted him. But nevertheless, that's what happened. And so here's the, the word, Jude, the term Judenstadt that he wrote, the Jewish state. And uh, so what is Christian Zionism? So Zionism is what we've just said. Christian Zionism is Christians who desire the Jewish people to occupy the land of Israel. Does anybody here believe that? A few of you do, yes, good. <laughs> well, definition of Christian Zionism is a religious belief among uh, some Gentiles of the Christian faith that the return of the Jews to the Holy Land and the restoration of a physical Israel is in accordance with biblical prophecy. Furthermore, Christian Zionism is motivated by a biblically-based religious conviction that the Jewish people are still God's chosen people and are entitled to possess the land of Israel for all time. This belief is based on a specific interpretation of Scripture. Imagine that. And uh, David Brog, who is a Jew who worked with a uh, non-Christian Jewish guy that worked with John Hagee, uh, he defined Christian Zionism as Christians who believe that it is God's will for the Jews to return to and rebuild Israel will enthusiastically support the enterprise. And uh, a good friend of mine, Paul Wilkinson from England, uh, he's going to be at our pre-trib conference this December our 33rd annual preacher of conference in Dallas-Fort Worth, uh, says Christian Zionism, and he, he wrote his Ph.D. dissertation at the University of Manchester on this issue. And he said Christian Zionism is an umbrella term under Christians who Israel have congregated. Did you all know we're congregating? <laughs> so uh, Brog says this tectonic theological shift was the result of something that might strike the uninitiated as insignificant, a new interpretation of, the, the, uh, of one word in the Bible, and that is Israel. Imagine that. Israel needs Israel. <laughs> Christian attitudes toward the Jews throughout the centuries have turned largely on the basic question of interpretation. And Recently, we've seen a lot of anti-Israel sentiment. And, and, and in fact, it, a poll just came out a couple of days ago in the United States, and 85% of Americans are pro-Israel, even right now, according to this poll. So why all of a sudden, everywhere you turn, there's all this anti-Israel stuff going on? I think it could be preparation for something that happens after the rapture. Oh, well, but <laughs> so you see stuff like this. This is obviously in London, uh, and stop the killings, you know, the occupation, Israel's occupying the land. <laughs> yeah, like 4,000 years ago. <laughs> Israel equals cancer in the Middle East, you see, and uh, half of these people, I've looked at all these pictures of these, half of them are Muslims, or people that look like they're from the Middle East, so, you know, that half are not. So uh, here they're blocking a freeway, uh, something people like to do. Yeah, I, 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 one guy just ran them over, I remember a while back, <laughs> and he had to get to work, he said. <clears throat> uh, there's just more of this pro-Palestinian, anti-Israel stuff going on in New York City. New York City? Get a rope. Uh, well, <clears throat> some of y'all know what I meant. Uh, and here's more British anti-Israel protests. Just look at the crowds, and you can see half of these people are look like they're from the Middle East or something like that, but and uh, this is one I've had for years, the world without Zionism. 
and that was uh, Mr. I can't get a job, uh, uh, Ahmadinejad, you know, from, from Iran. Zion is used 163 times in the Bible, seven times in the New Testament, the word Zion. And uh, these are some of the great leaders of the early nation of Israel, even before. And nevertheless, they, and here's, let's look at some of the t uses of this. Nevertheless, David captured the stronghold of Zion, that is the city of David. This is the first use in the Bible of the word Zion, 2 Samuel 5, 7. It goes back to David. That's Jerusalem, it is. And the inhabitants of Jabus said to David, you shall not enter here. Nevertheless, David captured the stronghold of Zion, that is the city of David. So Chronicles, and uh, already forgot what that was. Chronicles and Samuel are parallel books uh, from different perspectives. So here, here you have Mount Zion is right there, and this is uh, the city of David around 3,000 years ago. And so you see it being expanded. This is 950, about the time of uh, Solomon. And <clears throat> there's Mount Zion there as the city expands, and that's 440 B.C. And here's modern city of Jerusalem. And uh, Zion, uh, there's the Dome of the Rock, by the way, which was built to commemorate the, the temple. If you go back the last hundred years, they've totally changed the meaning of the Dome of the Rock, uh, the Muslims have. But it was actually built before they had archaeology to know what things looked like. It was supposed to be some kind of temple there, uh, originally built by one of the uh, Muslim guys. So uh, Psalm 2.6 says, But as for me, I've installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. Uh, Psalm 9.11, sing praises to the Lord who dwells in Zion. Declare among the people his deeds. By thy favor, do good to Zion. Build the walls of Jerusalem, Psalm 51.18. And his tabernacle is in Salem. His dwelling place also is in Zion. Salem refers to Jerusalem here in Psalm 76.2. The Lord loves the gates of Zion more than all the other dwelling places of Jacob, Psalm 87, 2. By the way, it's the same spot that uh, uh, Abraham was going to sacrifice his son, but he didn't, same, same spot there. Psalm 129, 5, May all who hate Zion be put to shame and turn backward. Turn, turn them backward. I guess send them in a different direction. <laughs> uh, Psalm 132, 13. For the Lord has chosen Zion. He has destined it for his habitation. You know, that's the idea. The temple there, the Shekinah glory was there, et cetera, his actual dwelling place. Psalm 137. This is a well-known one. One By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down and wept when we remembered Zion. They wanted them to sing a song for them. They wouldn't do it in Babylon. So Isaiah 4, 5, Then the Lord will create over the whole area of Mount Zion and over her assemblies a cloud by day, even smoke and the brightness of a flaming fire by night. The Shekinah glory, right? The glory cloud that led them out of Egypt. For over all the glory will be a canopy. Uh, Isaiah 34, 8. For the Lord has a day of vengeance, a year of recompense for the cause of Zion. Call the tribulation. <clears throat> Jeremiah 30, 17. For I will restore you to health, and I will heal you of your wounds, declares the Lord, because they have called you an outcast, saying, It is Zion. No one cares for her. That's kind of the attitude we see today, isn't it? throughout the world. It is Zion. No one cares for her. Joel 3.17, Then you will know that I am the Lord your God, dwelling in Zion, my holy mountain. So Jerusalem will be holy and strangers will pass through it no more. 
Jerusalem is the most conquered city in the history of the world. Something like 39, uh, they've had 39 seizures, uh, you know, hadn't necessarily been conquered that many times, but uh, uh, they've had all kinds of militaries passing through there over the years. Zechariah 8, 2, thus says the Lord of hosts, I am exceedingly jealous for Zion. Yes, with great wrath, I am zealous for her. So, people that oppose this are called replacement theology people. And those are people that believe that the church has been repl uh, has replaced Israel. Now, we, we, we're pro-church, but we haven't replaced Israel. That's why the church began suddenly and unexpectedly. It wasn't prophesied in the Old Testament. Jesus introduces it in John 14, 1 through 3, uh, the night before he was killed. And that's why you have it ending suddenly and unexpectedly with the rapture, see? So that God can do what? Finish the incomplete plan related to Israel. That's why you have to have a preacher of rapture, to remove the church so that God can complete what? The 70th week of Daniel that leads to the rescue of Israel. So replacement theology is the view that the church is the new or true Israel that has permanently replaced or superseded national Israel as the people of God. Supersessionism is another word for replacement theology and comes from two Latin words, super, on or upon, and sedere, to sit, as when one person sits on the chair of another displacing the latter. So replacement theology and supersessionism are developments in church history that are anti-Israel. Walter Kaiser, who, who is a dispensational, well, I wouldn't say, he's a pre-trib guy, and he's a, a, a great, he's still alive. He, he said, he's a great Old Testament scholar, says replacement theology declared that the church, Abraham's spiritual seed, has replaced national Israel in that it has transcended and fulfilled the terms of the covenant given to Israel, which covenant Israel had lost because of disobedience. Well, there's certainly no doubt that uh, Israel lost it, but when you make a covenant with a guy and you put him to sleep, <laughs> it's kind of a one-sided covenant. And uh, this is a tremendous book, Ron DePros, he's from Europe. And he says, replacement theology is the view that the church completely and permanently replaced ethnic Israel in the working out of God's plan and as recipient of Old Testament promises to Israel. So the church takes over all these promises in the Old Testament to, given to Israel. And here is a replacement the, the, theologian. He says that the New Testament affirms that Israel would no longer be the people of God and would be replaced by a people that would accept the Messiah and the message of his, the kingdom of God. So core beliefs of replacement theology, national Israel has somehow completed or forfeited its status as the people of God and will never again possess a unique role or function apart from the church. So the church is now the true Israel, they believe, or spiritual Israel, that has permanently replaced or superseded national Israel as the people of God. Uh, we, we believe the church is the people of God today, but, it, but it's temporary, right? The result is that the church has become the sole inheritor of God's covenant blessings originally promised to national Israel in the Old Testament. So this rules out any future restoration of national Israel if you hold these views. And so uh, DePros says, for replacement theology to qualify as a biblical option, passages which allow such an interpretation are not enough. There needs to po be positively passages which clearly teach it and negatively no passages which actually exclude it. And there are none, by the way. So here you have... May 14th, 1948, when David Ben-Gurion uh, declared Israel to be a nation. May 14th, 1948. And this is 
in the famous, anybody ever been there? I've been there, in this place in Tel Aviv. Yeah, on the, yeah, there's a few. Israel's independence is declared. Audio. Can't hear it. The will depart. The founding of the state of Israel in 1948 follows the nomination's recommendation for the council of departure of Jewish forces from Palestine. Israel's first prime minister, David Ben Gurion, proclaimed the state's independence on May 14, 1948, and opened its borders to Jewish immigration. The new state took the Star of David as its symbol. The Star of David with these. Two stripes represent the rabbinic robes or something like that. In the So how does the world view the book of Revelation? Here's MSNBC commentator Lawrence O'Donnell. Truly vicious God would bring about the end of the world. Now, no half-smart religious person believes the book of Revelation anymore. Those people are certain that their God would never turn into a malicious torturer and mass murderer beyond Hitler's wildest dreams. Yeah. So what, what does international law teach about supporting Israel? In other words, God has said the land of Israel belongs to Israel. But also you have supporting it is international law. So... Often on the news, we hear the terms occupied territories, 67 borders, and illegal settlements. And the story we usually hear sounds very simple. During the Six-Day War, Israel captured the West Bank from the Palestinians, refused the United Nations' demand to retreat, and illegally built settlements. But is that really the case? Let's try to understand the situation a little bit better. We'll start with a simple but extremely important question. From whom did Israel capture the West Bank? From the Palestinians? No. In 1967, there was no Arab nation or state by the name of Palestine. Actually, was there ever? No. Israel took over the West Bank from Jordan in an act of self-defense after Jordan joined a war launched by Egypt and Syria to destroy Israel. Oh, by the way, destroying countries is rather illegal. The United Nations back in 1967 rejected repeated Arab and Soviet attempts to declare Israel as the aggressor. Security Council Resolution 242 did not demand a unilateral Israeli withdrawal. Rather, the United Nations called for negotiating a solution which would leave Israel with secure and recognized boundaries, in effect, <coughs> defensible borders. But wait a second. What was Jordan doing in the West Bank in the first place? What was its legal justification? Well, Jordan had the, you know what? It had no legal justification. Jordan simply occupied it during its previous attempt to destroy the newly established state of Israel in 1948, changing the commonly accepted name Judea and Samaria to the West Bank. But that did not really convince anybody. And almost no one recognized the legality of Jordan's occupation, not even any of the other Arab states. So if Jordan had no legal claim to the land and a Palestine did not exist, whose territory is it? Let's go a little further back in time. Don't worry, not to the days of the Bible, only about 100 years. Until 1917, the Ottoman Empire occupied the whole region. After losing in World War I, the Ottomans relinquished their 500-year control to the Allied forces, which decided to divide the old empire into countries. Britain's foreign minister, Lord Balfour, recognized the Jewish people's historical right to their homeland, a small area equivalent to about half of 1% of the Middle East was designated for this purpose. Britain received a mandate from the League of Nations to promote the establishment of a Jewish homeland. But wait a second, do you realize what happened? The Jewish homeland originally included not only the West Bank, but also the East Bank of the Jordan River. I guess you cannot say the Jewish people have not accepted some painful compromises already. 
Anyway, the League of Nations recognition of a Jewish homeland, which includes the West Bank, was reaffirmed by the United Nations after the Second World War. With the British mandate ending, United Nations General Assembly Resolution 181 recommended the establishment of two states, one Jewish and one Arab. The Jews accepted it and went on to create the State of Israel, while the Arabs refused the compromise and launched a war to destroy the newly established Jewish state. Resolution 181, a non-binding recommendation in the first place, remained with no legal standard. At the end of the war, a ceasefire line was formed where the Israeli and Arab forces stopped fighting. At the insistence of the Arab leaders, this line was defined as having no political significance. So, although this line is commonly referred to as the 1967 border, it is not from 1967, and it was never an international border. This is why a more exact legal definition for the West Bank, according to international law, is really the same as in so many other areas where there are or were territorial disputes, but which are not defined as occupied. For example, Zubara, the Tams Islands, the Western Sahara, amongst many others. They are not considered occupied territories, but rather disputed territories. So let's return for a moment <coughs> to our illustration and examine the complete chain of events. Israel's presence in the West Bank is the result of a war of self-defense. The West Bank should not be considered occupied because there was no previous legal sovereign in the area. And therefore, the real definition should be disputed territory. The 1947 partition plan has no current legal standing, while Israel's claim to the land was clearly recognized by the international community during the 20th century. That is why the presence and construction of Israeli settlements in the West Bank should not be considered illegal. These are not just my own opinions. They are based on conclusions made by world-renowned jurists, like Professor Eugene Rastow, Justice Arthur Goldberg, and Stephen Schwebel, who headed the International Court of Justice. So what's the solution for the dispute over the West Bank? Unfortunately, there is no magic solution. But the only way a solution will ever be reached is if we base our negotiations on legal and historical facts. So please, Let's stop using the terms occupied territories and 67 borders. They're simply not politically correct. So, this is a guy named Jacques Paul Gautier, who's Canadian, and he spent 20 years doing a PhD dissertation. He's a uh, lawyer, legal guy. And, uh, in Geneva, Switzerland, at uh, the university there, and he wrote a, uh, it's like that thick, uh, doctoral dissertation showing that uh, the Jews have the right over Jerusalem, the legal right. And <laughs> with regard to the question, who owns Jerusalem in law. I know that the Jewish people, I know that Christians have an answer based on their faith in scripture in regard to that question. But come with me into another realm, the realm of international law. And the question is, who has title to this city, this holy city? It took me, 20 years to put together these uh, 1,400 pages, this. Copy of that, but I got a copy of it. <laughs> they don't sell it anymore. But uh, another scholar, Dr. Howard Grief, has written this book. You can get this, I think, on Amazon, called The Legal Foundation and Borders of Israel Under International Law. And he concludes the same thing. He traces the legal history of the land of Israel and the old city of Jerusalem up from 1516 up to the year 2001. And so Grief believes that uh, he's deceased now. He believes the modern state of Israel has the legal right to the entire land of Israel west of the Jordan River, including Gaza, Judea, and Samaria. And, and this is uh, Lord Balfour. 
Uh, he was the prime minister in England before he became uh, the foreign secretary uh, for 10 years. And uh, here's the famous letter uh, that was written for, uh, to Lord Rothschild. And Lord Rothschild was uh, a guy who headed up the Israel Fund, which for 200 years before 1948, they would buy land, often paying like seven, eight, nine times more. Uh, and it became part of what's called the Israel Fund. So this, this statement uh, says, His Majesty's government view with favor the establishment in Palestine by the way, the word Palestine was never used until around 135 A.D. That's why when we did the Tim LaHaye Prophecy Study Bible, we didn't use Palestine. We put Israel. All these maps in your Bibles say Palestine and all that. that that's anti, anti, well, whatever, another look at, uh, wrong labeling. So... Uh, the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people and will use their best endeavors to facilitate the achievement of this object, it being clearly understood that nothing shall be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of the existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine or the rights and political status enjoyed by Jews in any country. Do you, do you realize Israel even to this day, does not have a constitution. This is, this is what the current government's been trying to do, is establish something, because the courts, uh, the, for the last 20 years, overrule the laws passed by the Knesset. And they, the courts are self-appointing. In other words, they appoint themselves other people in, so it's very leftist in Israel. And so they strike down all this stuff, and so the current government has been trying to rein in the courts, and that's why there's all this stuff going on in Israel before the war started. So uh, here's the Ottoman Empire in 1900, and Balfour was born in Scotland and reared in a strong Christian home, which instilled into him a love for the Jews based upon a biblical interest. Balfour, a lifelong bachelor, even wrote a book on Christian philosophy, which is very liberal, by the way, and theology. Lord Balfour served much of his life within the highest offices of British government, including prime minister. His interest in Jewish restoration was a biblical rather than imperial. His sister and biographer said the following, Balfour's interest in the Jews and their history was lifelong. It originated in the Old Testament training of his mother and in his Scottish uh, upbringing. As he grew up, his intellectual admiration and sympathy for a certain aspect of Jewish philosophy and culture grew also. And the problem of the Jews in the modern world seemed to him of immense importance. He always talked er eagerly on this and I remember in childhood imbibing from him the idea that Christian religion and civilization owes to Judaism an immeasurable debt, shamefully ill repaid. And so he, he was a very important person. By the way, just two weeks ago, some Muslims defaced Balfour's, uh, there, there's a little museum place in Israel, and they went in and, you know, what they do, spray paint it and do all that kind of junk to it. Here's David Lloyd George, and he was the prime minister of Israel, of uh, Britain when this occurred. And uh, he was British prime minister from 1916 to 1922 when the Balfour Declaration was issued. Balfour and Lloyd George were both lifelong friends. He was from Wales and was steeped in the Bible in which he was trained as a youth. He was adopted, by the way. Uh, this clearly predisposed him to view with favor the Zionist movement. It was Lloyd George's decision that was primarily responsible for the British launching a large-scale offensive to conquer all of Palestine despite the risk. 
So as a Christian Zionist, he was determined to gain control of Palestine without the French to interfere. Thank God. Uh, he also wanted his country to carry out what he regarded as God's work in Palestine. Lloyd George made a number of statements concerning his biblical upbringing, which influenced him throughout his life. Lloyd George recalled how in his first meeting with Chaim Weizmann, who took over from, um, what's his name who died, uh, who wrote the book? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Chaim Weizmann took over from, I, I can't think of things here. Uh, well, and he was the first president of Israel, not the prime minister. Those are different things. So Chaim Weizmann in December 1914 placed names kept coming back into the conversation that were more familiar to me than those of the Western Front. That's when Britain was fighting the war, see. Lord Balfour's biographer says that his interest in Zionism stemmed from his boyhood training in the Old Testament under the guidance of his mother. So this is uh, Lord George's fourth from the left right there. And when England uh, was in a war, rather than passing everything through Parliament, which was hard, they would have what's called a war cabinet of like 12 people that represented the British Empire at that time, which was very large. And so this is a picture of a, one of the war cabinets that they had during World War I. So uh, in this book by Donald M. Lewis, he says, in terms of religious background, seven of the nine Gentile members had been raised in evangelical homes or personally embraced evangelicalism. Six of these seven had been raised in evangelical Calvinist homes. Now, some of y'all may think Calvinism is bad, but that is where evangelicalism came from, modern evangelicalism. Uh, that These were the evangelicals of the time. Balfour was from the Church of Scotland, which was Presbyterian. Lloyd George was a Baptist. Uh, Lord Curzon, Evangelical Anglican. Uh, Andrew Bonar Law, the Free Church of Scotland, who was Presbyterian. Uh, John Smuts, a Dutch Calvinist. Edward Carson, an Irish Presbyterian. By the way, look at this from President Nixon. Secretary of State Henry Kissinger, in turning down Golda Meir's request for arms to defend her country, is reported to have said, let the Israelis bleed a little. Golda Meir is desperate. Without help, Israel will not survive many more days of the pounding assault from all sides, despite all the Kahalanis and those like him who are bravely defending their homeland and sacrificing their lives on all the front lines. And so she picks up the phone and calls the private line of U.S. President Richard Nixon. It is 3 o'clock in the morning. Television film producer and documentarian Bill McKay's investigation of the American role in the Yom Kippur War describes what happened when President Nixon took Golda Meir's call in the middle of the night. Mr. President, if you don't help us, the Jewish people will never survive. He said something interesting, if not strange. He said, you know, I could almost hear my mother's voice. She would tell me stories and read to me from the Old Testament the heroes of the Bible. And one afternoon, she said, Richard, someday you're going to be in a position where you can help save the Jewish people. And when that day comes, you must do everything in your power. And he said at that moment, I realized, maybe for the first time in my presidency, why I had become president of the United States. It was the largest airlift of armaments since World War II. The president kept his word. Everything Golda asked for, she got. Every weapon, every vehicle, every piece of equipment, and all the ammunition to operate them. A virtual arsenal airlifted overnight to Israel's front lines. And many military experts credit that decision, that request, at that moment, as the essential element that saved Israel from destruction. In another striking parallel to David in the Bible, 
Richard Nixon turned aside the Goliath of indifference to Israel and his government, faced down a powerful Secretary of State who would turn against him, and accepted the threat to his own presidency to save Israel in its hour of need. Before it was over, the Yom Kippur War demonstrated one of the most incredible turnaround victories ever recorded in military history. So, it's interesting how the Lord works. So, you had the British mandate, uh, as we've already seen, 1920 to 46, which Palestine, or the land of Israel, included Jordan, as well as all of the so-called West Bank. Uh, and then they split it in 1922, and then it was going to be, this was going to be the uh, home of uh, Israel, Palestine. And, and by the way, this started in 1919, when they were going to start to develop the land of uh, Israel after World War I. And you had the UN partition plan from 1947. And you had all of these Arab leaders from that time had, had agreed to it. Believe it or not. And uh, January 3rd, 1919, Faisal Wiseman agreed. Uh, July 28th, 1919, the Paris Peace Conference ends with the Versailles Treaty. And... Uh, so they didn't deal with the Middle East, so they had to have another conference, and that was the San Remo Conference. It's a treaty that includes a, a place for Israel. On January 19th, the Arab leaders mutually support each other. Uh, April 1919, Arabs and Jews present their tr territorial claims. And June 28, 1919, Article 22, temporary mandate powers, uh, mandatory powers uh, until the people can develop. In other words, this was a, to be overseen by Britain and France. Britain had what is called Israel today, and they were to oversee this transition until these new countries could uh, be on their own. And that happened all throughout the Middle East. So here's a San Remo conference, and they had their 100th anniversary recently. I was invited to speak at it, but I wasn't able to go. And this is where they, uh, the, the great powers, so to speak, gave, based on international law, the right of the land of Israel to the Jews, as they had to other countries in other parts of the agreement. So uh, the high contracting parties agree that Syria and Mesopotamia shall, in accordance with the fourth paragraph of Article 22, Part 1, Covenant of the League of Nations, which was the forerunner to the United Nations, be provisionally recognized as independent states subject to the rendering of administration, administrative advice and assistance by a mandatory until such time as they are able to stand alone. So you see uh, them doing the same thing. Here he says, the declaration originally made in November 8, 1917 by the British government, that's the Balfour Declaration, and adopted by the other allied powers, they all agreed with it, the United States, Woodrow Wilson was totally behind it in the United States, in favor of the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people it being clearly understood that nothing shall be done which may prejudice, and that's written into, this is from the Balfour Declaration, written into uh, this agreement, prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine are the rights and political status enjoyed by Jews in any other country. Never renounce their claim or right to the old city or any part of Jerusalem. They've never formally abandoned the right to receive title, sovereignty. But the nations refuse to recognize any longer these claims because of other political doctrines like the doctrine of self-determination, which was not relevant. And there's a principle in international law that says you can't retroactively apply legal principles. 
The Jewish people have the legal right to remain in each and every part of the territory which was part of the mandata manda mandated territory. They have the right, if they want, to give up what is theirs, but they cannot be pushed out. The nations have reneged on the obligations that they embraced when the League of Nations in 1922 adopted the mandate for Palestine. What I want you to remember today is that when you hear Jews, when you hear Christians say they have a good claim to Jerusalem, I want you to remember that under the law of nations, under international law, they have a very solid, valid claim which ought to be honored by the nations today. Now, we, he spoke at our pre-trib conference about 10 years ago, so you could look on our website and uh, look at his hour-plus lecture that he gave us at the pre-trib conference. So, Resolution 242, authorizing Israel to remain in possession of all the land until it secured and recognized boundaries. And the resolution was notably silent on Jerusalem and also referred to the necessity for achieving a just settlement of the refugee problem with no di distinction made between Jewish and Arab refugees. So, what does that mean? God says he has given the land to Israel forever. International law says the land belongs to Israel. So we're watching and waiting for the next phase of what's happening. And, of course, we've seen what's happened uh, in relation to recently with the um, war that's going on and the attack on the nation of Israel. And... We need to pray for Benjamin Netanyahu. They're trying to, you know, that crazy senator from Schumer, you know, who has been a lifelong friend of Netanyahu. They've probably, he's been to Schumer's house like 10 times. And, uh, you know, they're both Jewish. And yet he comes out trying to say that, um, Netanyahu needs to be removed as prime minister. Well, and, and others are starting to say that now. But uh, actually, when you look at the polls in Israel, if they had an election uh, six months ago, uh, Likud, his party, wasn't doing very well. But now it's even, at least even, with the others, you see. And, of course, they keep trying to manufacture legal things to disqualify. And Erhard Barak, who was prime minister for about nine months, he never was elected. He took it over from someone else. He's behind all of this. And he's very anti-conservative uh, stuff. And he is a guy that had organized for 10 months before the war started those protests in Israel that they, they've been having and stuff. And so all these interesting things going on, we know even though the Muslims repeatedly say Israel is going to be wiped off the map, we know better, don't we? And uh, we know that God's going to somehow pull them through this. I'll be honest with you, I can't figure it out myself, you know, how they're going to get out of this situation and then... Uh, make an agreement where the first, ha you know, rebuild the temple and all that kind of stuff, you know. Well, let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for the fact that you have a plan for history, you have a plan for your Israel, and uh, you've written about them all throughout the Bible, starting in Genesis chapter 12, throughout the rest of Scripture, and we know that you're not going to abandon your people or you wouldn't have preserved them as a distinct people group all these years. And I also pray for the spreading of the gospel among the Jewish people. 
in all peoples right now, the Arabs as well, that uh, as we appear to be right before the rapture here, that many would come to know Christ as their Savior. And we thank you for this conference as we uh, gather together to learn more about your plan for history. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you, buddy. We have about a 20-minute coffee break, and there's coffee up in the fellowship hall, and you can check out the tables also, and Tommy's book on Zionism. Great. Bless you. See you back here in 20 minutes.
Okay. We are ready to go? If I could have your attention. Fellowship is so wonderful. We'd like to welcome you back to uh, our second se session with Dr. Lutzer. And just, I just want to say that uh, no charge for the conference. If you'd like to make a donation, uh, we'd appreciate it. It helps cover the expenses, and there's a agape box back there. Also, we have extra restrooms on the lower level if we run out of space up here, which we did. So extra restrooms downstairs. It's such a joy to have Dr. Lutzer with us this morning. And uh, he's going to share, and when he's done, we're going to ask him a few questions. And uh, in fact, if, if you have a real question for him, where's Perry? Get that microphone ready just in case. I've got a lot of questions for Dr. Lutzer, but you may have some questions as well. But uh, Dr. Lutzer is Pastor Emeritus at the Moody Church, where he served as senior pastor for 36 years. And he's the featured speaker on three radio programs that are heard on over a thousand plus outlets in the United States. I'm sure some of you have heard him. He's got a distinct voice, uh, speaks with love, grace, and authority when, he, when you hear him, running to win, the Moody Church Hour, and songs in the night. Dr. Lutzer is also author of numerous books, and we have several of Dr. Lutzer's books back on the back table. Uh, among them, We Will Not Be Silenced. What a wonderful book. When he was here a couple years ago, he, he spoke based upon that, that book, bestseller. And then uh, No Reason to Hide, one of his latest books, Pandemics, Plagues, and National Disasters, One Minute After You Die. When a Nation Forgets God, great book. We have that on the book table back there. And the Christian Booksellers Gold Medallion Award winner, Hitler's Cross. Dr. Lutzer and his wife, Rebecca, live in the Chicago area, and they have three grown children. So it's my privilege to present to you Dr. Erwin Lutzer. Thank you, Dr. Lutzer. Well, thank you, and what a delight it is for me to at least connect with you by Zoom. Before I go any farther, I want to make sure, am I well heard? Is everyone able to listen? You know, sometimes technology works well, sometimes it has some glitches. So since I'm not hearing back, I'm going to assume that we are connected. I sure wish that I were with you directly and personally, it didn't work out this time, but even as I look at the pulpit, I remember preaching from the pulpit a couple of times at your conference a number of years ago. So to all of our friends in Indiana, welcome. Well, I'm going to speak to you on the topic, we will not bow, we will not bow. And uh, I'm doing this because your pastor asked me to speak about these issues and I'm most happy to entertain questions that you might have at the end of my talk, because we are living in some very trying times. You might even want to ask about such controversial issues such as Christian nationalism, to just throw out a term that is oftentimes spoken about today. But we will not bow. In 1937, one of Stalin's deputies gave a lecture in Russia on the glories and the beauties of Stalin, his greatness, his leadership. When he was finished, according to Solzhenitsyn in his book, The Gulag, when he was finished, the applause, says Solzhenitsyn, went on and on, seven minutes, eight minutes. In fact, uh, he says their goose was cooked. 
I'm going to be commenting on that phrase a little later. But he says, uh, the hall which was crowded, they just kept clapping and clapping. Some people almost collapsed. And finally, after 11 minutes, the director of a paper factory actually sat down. Everyone was so relieved because then everybody could finally sit down. That night, the director of the paper factory was arrested, given 10 years in prison on trumped up charges. But he was told during his interrogation, whatever you do, don't be the first one to stop clapping. So we're living in an era in which uh, I have to ask this question, are we here in America being Sovietized? I'm sure that you've listened to Victor David Hansen. He's a very insightful interpreter of our culture. He actually, in an article, gave 10 reasons why we are being Sovietized. I'm only going to choose two of them, and to help us to understand the culture before we turn to the scriptures and find out what they have to say about our dilemma. The first reason he gives is because he says in the Soviet Union, it was not ability that got you ahead. It was loud enthusiasm for the Soviet system. So it wasn't whether or not you were capable. That wasn't the major issue. It was there was so much ideological indoctrination that the question was whether or not you really were up to date on the Soviet system and whether or not you were promoting it. That was more important than competence. You look at it today. Let's suppose that you are a chemist and you have applied for a degree, or I should say for a job in a university, and uh, you want to teach chemistry. The issue will not simply be, are you a good chemist? The issue will be, are you willing to accept all of the ideologies of the culture? Are you willing to accept the trans movement? Are you comfortable with multiple pronouns? I have a dentist who had to go through sensitivity training. He was told that he had to give deference to the LGBTQ plus community. And uh, he's the only one who asked a question. The question he asked was this. He says, I try to treat everyone alike. I have atheists, I have Muslims, why can't I just treat everyone alike? And they said, and the answer was, well, because when it comes to the LGBTQ plus community, that is their identity. So you have to give them acceptance and deference, even though you don't have to accept the Muslim faith, just because one of your clients is a Muslim, but you have to accept their identity. If not, it said that there could be repercussions. So there you have it. It's not enough that you be a good dentist, treat everyone alike. No, the issue really is, are you willing to abide by the ideologies of the culture? I could go on and give other illustrations, but I don't need to because you know of them yourself. So the first reason is loud enthusiasm to the ideologies of our culture. There's a second reason, and that has to do with the fusion of the government and the media. And we certainly saw that, didn't we, during the cancel culture. If you have a different view of vaccines, if you have a different view of uh, such things as gender ideology, you may be canceled. As a matter of fact, a couple of years ago, I think it was in 2020, a message that I gave was canceled on YouTube, and it was canceled for medical misinformation. Now, I didn't comment on the vaccine. I said nothing about whether or not it was effective. I just made the statement that cloth masks were not effective. In fact, I was wearing a mask, but I was wearing a very expensive one, and I was making the point, and that hit the algorithms. And um, anyway, the point is this. We're living in a culture in which truth is being censored. And in Russia, pravda means truth. Pravda is the means of communication. 
And it's the newspapers, it's all of the um, news that is approved by government. And we certainly have seen that in the last few years in America. All of us know that we're living at a time when if you don't go along with the accepted ideologies of the culture, if you don't accept those views, you know that you could be in trouble. And if I had more time, I could talk to you about why it is that on the college campuses today, when a conservative speaks, why you have so much opposition. That's a separate talk that I can have with you. But the point that I want to make today is, oh, by the way, speaking of propaganda, and you know, in both the books that your pastor mentioned, in We Will Not Be Silenced and No Reason to Hide, I have chapters on propaganda because of my interest in Nazi Germany, where propaganda ruled. Remember, the purpose of propaganda is to so shape people's view of reality that even when confronted with a mountain of evidence, they will not change their minds. That's the purpose of propaganda, and um, I try to explain how it works. But I want you to know that the cancel culture and clapping, making sure that you bow, is nothing new. As a matter of fact, in the Old Testament, there's a story, and if you brought your Bibles, you can turn to Daniel chapter 3. And because I'm actually looking at you through the ability of technology, I'll know whether or not any of you brought your Bibles, <laughs> because you can turn to uh, the third chapter of the book of Daniel. And you remember the story. I'm not even going to read the first part of the chapter because you know it well. Nebuchadnezzar sets up, he sets up an image that's 90 feet high. And this 90 feet high image was the image of a man, almost certainly himself. And uh, he brings everyone out to the plain of Dura, and he says, when the music begins, and he lists seven or eight different kinds of instruments, he says, when the music begins, everybody fall down, everybody clap, everybody worship. And if you don't, you'll be thrown into the lake of fire. In other words, I mean, not the lake of fire, but the furnace of fire. In other words, clap or else. And apparently everybody bows down. But there are three stubborn Jews who don't bow down. And remember that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, affectionately known as shake the bed, make the bed, and into bed you go, those three men were known to Nebuchadnezzar. They were his advisors. So somebody tattled on them, the Bible says. And they went to the king and they said, Oh, king, there are three Jews who have not bowed down. And the scripture says that the king was enraged. He was angry. And he brought these three guys in and gave them a lecture. But he said, I want you to know that I'm actually a very gracious king. I say that with a smile on my face because you know that he wasn't. But he says, in effect, look, let's have a redo. Maybe um, your cell phone wasn't on and you didn't get the memo. Maybe you didn't hear the news. Maybe you were off somewhere and the decree that I issued was not... Um, was not heard by you. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you the benefit of a doubt. We're going to have a redo. We're going to do the same thing again and give you a chance to enter into my good graces by having this done all over again. Now, if your Bibles are open, we're going to be introduced to one of the most remarkable statements of faith in all of Scripture. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, this I think is verse 16, said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. We don't need a listening session. This doesn't have to go on for long, because uh, we've made up our minds and we can tell you exactly what we're going to do. 
If this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, but if not, let it be known unto you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden calf that you have been that you have set up, or the golden image that you have set up. Now, what I want to do is to isolate three convictions that these men had that enabled them to not bow. What were those convictions? First of all, they believed in the power of God. We believe, O oh God, that our God, we believe, O oh King, that our God is able to deliver us. Of course, that's standard theology. The fact that you are at this conference means that, of course, you believe that God is sovereign and he can deliver people. Our God is in the heavens. He has done whatsoever he has pleased, the Bible says. And uh, the Lord reigns over all. We know that. But they knew that they were experiencing or they could experience the power of God. But secondly, they also believed, and here we come to a very important point, in the providence of God. When they spoke to the king, they did not have absolute certainty that they would be delivered. We usually think, well, you know, they got thrown in there and they knew that the fourth man was going to walk among them. Not necessarily. They said, if not, let it be known unto you, O king. But what they're saying is we're going to leave it to God. And whatever God does, we're going to accept. So they just committed themselves to God. Let me ask you a personal question this morning. Are you comfortable with the unpredictability of God? The fact that God's providence extends and we often don't know what God is going to do? Are you willing to say, we believe, O oh God, that you're able to deliver this young woman from cancer? And uh, we even, Lord, believe you will. But if not, we will continue to worship you. You know, the older I get, and I spend quite a bit of time contemplating God, I have to say that there's a great deal of mystery connected with God, much that I don't understand, because if I were God, I certainly would do things differently. But we have to be comfortable with that. Isn't it Acts chapter 12 where Herod kills James with a sword, and then Peter is to be brought out the next day? And what's Peter doing in prison? He's sleeping. Now, I've often wondered, why was Peter sleeping in prison, knowing that he was going to be executed the next day? The only thing I can think of is that he wanted to make sure that he was rested when he got to heaven. He wanted to be able to see all the divine sights and not be tired. But there he is sleeping. The angel touches his side. The uh, gates of the prison open, just like if you walk into a jewel store today or Walgreens, the doors open. He walks through them. Rhoda, of course, is totally surprised. It's a beautiful story. but. James is killed, Peter lives. The providence of God. Let's go back to World War II. The Allies are in Dunkirk. It appears as if the Germans are going to win this battle. There's really no way that the Allies can see other than total destruction. Well, I'm told that the head of the Allies, the leader, commander, he sent a telegram back to England was just three words, but if not. You see, in those days, England was a, it was still a quasi-Christian country. It had a Christian consensus, which it doesn't have today. England had a Christian consensus, and people would have known this refers to Daniel 3.18, and if they didn't know, they could have asked. What the commander was saying is, look, we're going to fight to the death. And if God doesn't deliver us, even so, we're going to be faithful. So here, 
they believed, these three men believed, in the power of God, the providence of God. And um, just to make it rhyme, I suppose, they also believed, that has to do with my outline, they also believed in the presence of God. They knew that even if they were thrown into the lake of fire, even if there was no visible fourth man, they would be in God's hands and not the hands of Nebuchadnezzar. That God would be with them. And, and by the way, it just comes to mind, think of what they'd have missed if they had bowed. They'd have missed this awesome miracle. Because they're thrown into the lake of fire, they turn out to be the asbestos kids, because no matter how hot the fire is, they do not burn. And uh, they live to tell the story, so to speak. God does the miracle. And they wouldn't have experienced that if they had bowed with everybody else. Now, I don't know whether or not you came to this meeting today to take notes. Some of you did, some of you didn't. But if you plan to take notes and haven't taken any so far, this would be a very good place to begin. Because what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this story and the lessons that are derived from it applying it to our own culture. So that's where we're going. I'll still be with you for a few minutes on this. Number one, we must learn to stand alone. We must learn to stand alone. Now, I understand that there are three men here, so they weren't exactly alone, but we have to stand alone. When your children go to college, they aren't going to get a lot of support if it's a secular school. They aren't going to get a lot of support from other students. The best thing they can do is find other st Christian students, but they're going to have to make some tough choices alone. Some of you know that, uh, by the way, you know, when it comes to college today, your teenager or your college student might not be talked out of their faith, but they will be mocked out of their faith. You mean you believe in this old book that teaches these restrictions? So they have to learn to stand alone. And speaking of standing alone, some of you know that even though I'm not Lutheran, I'm a great fan of Martin Luther, I'm thinking of them there at the Diet of Worms. And it is Worms. I know that in English, it's Worms. And uh, we have to get that straight. W in German is a V. It's Worms. But here's the point. Uh, Pastor, I don't know if you're acquainted with my book on Martin Luther, on the Reformation. And um, it has to do with uh, rescuing the gospel. That's the title. But in that book... I tell the story of Martin Luther before the Diet of Worms, the night before. He cried up to God because he expected to be killed, and he should have been killed, were it not for some divine providences I wish I could take time to tell you about. But he said, God, where are you? I don't feel your presence. Don't abandon me when I'm on the rack. And when my body is being torn to bits, oh, God, be with you. Be with me. The point I'm trying to make is this, that he, he didn't necessarily experience the great presence of God. But based on God's bare word, he was willing to do what he did. And in doing that, he stood against a thousand years of church history, the pope, all the bishops, the head of the Holy Roman Empire was present, King Charles. There are times, friends, when we just have to stand alone, like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now, were there others that didn't bow? We don't know. Maybe there were some. Maybe nobody saw them. But these three said, even if we're the only three, we will not bow. A second lesson is that we must fear God more than we fear the fire. They feared God 
more than they feared the fire. And now we get back to Solzhenitsyn's comment, their goose was cooked. Well, a hundred years before Martin Luther, there was a man by the name of John Hus who preached the gospel in Prague in the Bethlehem Chapel. Now, the name Hus is actually uh, goose in the Czech language. As a matter of fact, he used to sign his letters the goose. So he is ostracized. He has to leave because the Pope doesn't like what he's doing. The crowds are coming to hear him, to hear the gospel. He is told that he will have safe conduct to Constance, where there was a big meeting of the leaders of the church. And it's during this time they're trying to resolve this embarrassing controversy of having three popes reigning simultaneously, each one calling the other Antichrist and raising funds to go to war with the other one. And uh, Sigismund, who was the emperor, said to Hus, if you come here, we guarantee you safe conduct back home to Prague. Constant, Constance is in Germany. And uh, so Hus goes. Good King Wenceslas was a brother of the emperor and uh, said, yeah, you go and you can come back. Well, when Hus got there, he was put in prison. They tried to humiliate him. Some of the letters that he wrote in prison are just unbelievable. Finally, when it came time to try him, they put a crown on his head, and it says, we commit your soul to the devil. Hus said, I commit my soul to the living God. So Sigismund decided he didn't have to keep his word to a heretic. So Hus was taken, and he was taken and he was burned at the stake. But before he was burned, he said these words, you can cook this hus, you can cook this goose, but after me in a hundred years, a swan will arise and him you will not silence. A hundred and two years later, Luther nailed his 95 theses to the castle church door in Wittenberg, and Luther believed, he wrote, that he believed that he was the fulfillment of Huss's prophecy. Here's my point. Throughout history, there have been Christians like Huss and like these men in the Old Testament who feared God more than they feared the fire. And you and I have to fear God more than we do the culture that is breaking in on us, insisting that we go along with it, insisting that we clap. So that's a second lesson. A third lesson is this, that um, you can't choose your circumstances, but you can choose who you're going to worship. We're living in a very dark time in America. We can't choose our circumstances. We can't choose what's happening, but we can. We can continue to worship God and we can continue to bow down before the Lord rather than before our culture. We still have that option. And then we work out our commitment from there. Number four, it is not necessary to win in this life in order to win in the life to come. It's not necessary to win in this life. You look at the martyrs throughout church history, they didn't win. In this life, you know, when the boxers came to China, I read this story. They were trying to rid China of all Western influence, and they put a cross at the door of a Christian school, and they told the students, if you step on the cross, which means you despise it, you can live. If you walk around the cross because you want to honor it, you'll be put to death. Well, the first eight students stepped on the cross. They were allowed to live, but number nine was a girl. She bowed her head and prayed that God would give her the grace to do what she knew she should, and she honored the cross, and she was shot, and all the other students took her example and were killed. 
Now, did that girl win? Not in this life. The other day, we had a primary here in Illinois. You might have had one also there in Indiana. And uh, there's a Christian politician who is running for a particular office in the Congress. And uh, he's a very conservative Christian politician. Well, he didn't win. He did well, but he didn't win. I reminded him, you don't have to win. You only have to be faithful. So we don't always have to win in this life. As far as the culture war is concerned, we have pretty well lost it. The question is, what does faithfulness look like? There's another lesson, and that is the power of a faithful witness. The power of a faithful witness. Would this shock you? If I were to tell you that I believe that Nebuchadnezzar is actually going to be in heaven. Yeah, even the moody commentary agrees with me. You've heard of God. You've heard of Moody, I'm sure. Why? Nebuchadnezzar began to believe in the true God after this event. As a matter of fact, he gave a decree saying everybody is supposed to worship the God of Abraham, excuse me, the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Then later God humbled him. For seven months, he was like an animal. There is a disease like that, I forget the name, but he was out in the pastures eating grass. That'll humble you. And what does he say at the end? This takes your breath away. At the end of the day, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up mine eyes to heaven, and I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever and ever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from one generation to another. And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing, and he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven and amongst the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his hand or say unto him, what doest thou? Wow. He became a worshiper of the true God. And in Old Testament terms, that means that he came to faith in Jehovah, it seems to me. I want you to hear me carefully. There are people that some of you are working with who are very hostile to the Christian faith. If you show them love without uh, you know, surrendering truth, and you have a loving, caring witness, you never know whom God might save. Solzhenitsyn, I referred to him at the beginning. He was basically, he was baptized in Orthodox Christian church, in an Orthodox Christian church as an infant. He lost his faith. He became a communist. He was thrown into the gulag. And that changed his mind. He began to see how evil communism was. One night, a doctor came and sat on, with him. And the doctor encouraged Solzhenitsyn to rekindle his faith in Christ. And there's evidence that Solzhenitsyn indeed did come to faith in Jesus Christ. Later on, he says, oh, God, you were with me the whole time, and I didn't know it. That doctor did not know that he led a man to Christ, a historian who is going to expose the communist system to the entire world. Everyone knows the name Solzhenitsyn. But that night, that doctor was clubbed to death. As I emphasize, he didn't know the good that he had done. Brothers and sisters, you have no idea of the good that you have done. God hides it from us so that we might not see it. We have no idea. You know, I, I love to use the illustration of Joseph Moore. Joseph Moore, over there in Austria, comes home on a very uh, wintry night, very still night, but very cold. And uh, he looks over this little village, and he sees some of the lights on. Of course, there weren't any electric lights in those days. 
but there were some lamp lights. And he says to himself, I don't think that the best Christmas carol has yet been written. He goes back and says, writes, Heilige stille Nacht, heilige Nacht, alles schläft, einsam wacht. Don't worry, I didn't just break into tongues. That's Silent Night, Holy Night in German. He dies at the age of 42, tuberculosis or something. He does not know that he gave the world its most famous Christmas carol sung in 120 countries every Christmas. I could give example after example where God, and that's why when I was with you a few years ago, I preached on the judgment seat of Jesus Christ. But I assume that I used this verse when I did that, where it says in Revelation chapter 14, 13, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord henceforth, for their works do follow them. And the judgment seat of Christ comes later because all of the good works that people have done, the ripples have not yet gone all the way to the shore. So be encouraged. Yesterday, my wife and I were out with a couple whom we had not seen in 10 years. And she reminded me of a phone call. I actually was thinking I was call calling her husband, but she picked it up because her husband was about to die. Now, he didn't die, and that's the story that she was telling us because he was there yesterday. He didn't die, but here's the thing. She, she said, I prayed with her on the phone. I have absolutely no memory of doing that. But we do many things in life that we forget about. Others remember, but God remembers. So you're doing a lot more good than you think you're doing. I want to encourage you. I believe that the church is going to head for a great separation. You see a falling away, the LGBTQ you know, agenda. Maybe I should mention this, that in Oxford, England, churches are graded like traffic lights based on their relationship to the LGBTQ plus community. Churches with a red light that means stay away because this church believes that homosexual relationships are sinful. And you might actually hear that from the pulpit. That's the red light. The yellow light is this church believes that they are sinful, but you'll never hear anything about it. So you can make up your own mind. And then the green light is, well, all the flags are there, all the agenda. So the time might come when that might be happening in America. Churches graded on the basis of whether or not they accept the culture. Now, Henry Blackaby, who died not too long ago, said on one occasion, Do you not already hear the warnings of God? Do you not see that the enemy is coming in like a flood? God is trying to raise up a standard against it, and you and I are that standard. But because of my interest in Nazi Germany and um, two books I've written about it, the one actually your pastor referred to both, Hitler's Cross, which is the larger book, and then the other one, um, you know, When a Nation Forgets God, Seven Lessons We Must Learn from Nazi Germany. You can read one or the other. They aren't dependent on each other, but there is a little bit of overlap of content. I find the story of Niemöller very interesting. Maybe since you're having a conference on prophecy and culture, I can give you an extra story. This is an extra bonus. Hitler is shouting at the pastors because he thought he could break the church more easily than he could. And he said, you take care of the churches. I will take care of the German people. Niemöller, choosing his words very carefully, waited until the end, shook hands with Hitler and said, you said that you take care of the German people, we were to take care of the church, but we also have an obligation 
to the German people that God has given us that will not be taken away. Hitler turned away without a word. That night, Niemöller's offices were ransacked. People who had joined the emergency, uh, emergency League took down their signatures because they thought Niemöller should not have confronted Hitler on this. Anyway, this is a paragraph from his last message to the church before he went to a concentration camp, though he did survive the concentration camp, as you might know, though he has since passed away. Uh, let me get the correct reading here, and this is what he says. We have all of us, the whole church and the whole community, we've been thrown into the tempter's sieve, and he is shaking us, and the wind is blowing, and it must now become manifest whether we are wheat or chaff. We must see that the calm, meditative days of Christianity are at an end. And we've had in America calm, meditative Christianity, which is good, but you can't be neutral anymore. They're coming to an end. It is now springtime for the hopeful and expectant Christian church. It is testing time, and God is giving Satan a free hand so that he may shake us up that it may be seen whether we are wheat or chaff. Satan swings his sieve, and Christianity is thrown hither and thither, and he who is not ready to suffer, he who calls himself a Christian only because he thinks thereby to gain something, and we have plenty of people like that, it says that he will be thrown away like the chaff and blown away like the wind. So we're not in a unique period of history in this sense. Many cultures have suffered far worse than we have. In fact, uh, you know, I get the magazine Voice of the Martyrs. There are stories there I can scarcely read about what our brothers and sisters are going through for the cause of Christ. So be optimistic. God is still God. I spoke about Nebuchadnezzar, who was a very evil king until his conversion later. And yet three times in Jeremiah, God says, he is my servant. He was even God's servant to go into Jerusalem, capture the Jews, and bring them back to Babylon, despite the horrendous suffering, including taking Jewish babies and throwing them against a wall and so forth. So, Pastor, I have now ended my talk, and uh, I probably took up more time than you were hoping for, so I do have a couple of, I have some time for questions if you would like to ask any. Yes, wonderful. Uh, Tom Hughes is here, and he's going to join me. He just arrived. Tom uh, was in Israel just a couple days ago, and so he's still in jet lag from from the Middle East, and he's got a nice Jerusalem tan. So should we go in the middle here? Go in the middle? Okay. I think so we're just going to stand here. Is that good? Okay. Dr. Uh, Lutzer, this is uh, Tom Hughes. And, uh, I can see you. I see what you're drinking. Are you drinking water or something else? <laughs> I'm not going to say. In fact, the last time I saw you was in Gethsemane, and you were filming there one day. And I walked in on you filming. I, I, you had, you had the, the, uh, you had Gethsemane reserved for yourself and your crew, and I barged in. But I didn't bother you. I let you go. Yeah, apparently you did, because I have no memory of you barging in. I tried not to bother you. <laughs> well, God bless you. I'll introduce uh, Tom formally uh, this afternoon. But, uh, Dr.
written over 70 books and uh, just outstanding. And I'm sure that, uh, do you have a favorite book or, or when you write them, that, that's your favorite? Well, I do have a favorite, but you don't have a copy. <laughs> and the reason is it's coming out in September and it's entitled <laughs> The Eclipse of God our nation's disastrous search for a more inclusive deity. And uh, this book was inspired by an article that was written by a British correspondent who said that uh, it, the online version was nearer my God to me. And the article says God is becoming just like us. He's as liberal as we are. Churches are now accepting same-sex marriage Nobody believes in the smighty almighty of the Old Testament, the God who smote the Egyptians, the God who smote Sodom and Gomorrah. That God is gone. And now God is agreeing with us about everything. And so what I do is, in the Eclipse of God, I talk about the shadows of Europe. It's philosophical, the first couple of chapters. I talk about Nietzsche, I talk about, uh, very briefly, about Darwin and Freud and Marx, because Nietzsche said that we have buried God. Listen to the noise of the grave diggers. Who are those grave diggers? He doesn't tell us, but I suggest it's those three. So I show how the shadows of Europe have come to us. I talk about this Namely, is God more tolerant than he used to be? Discussing the Old Testament versus the New. And then I'll end the description with the last chapter, returning to the God of wrath and grace, not unconditional love. So I think that is going to be my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> we'll look forward to receiving that and reading it. Uh, no reason to hide, and uh, we will not be silenced. Those are two prolific books for right now. Uh, well, exactly. For example, uh, No Reason to Hide, I um, have a whole chapter on DEI, which is being discussed today, talked about, and uh, I have a biblical view. In fact, the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association has just published... Um, I think uh, more than 20,000 copies to give to their supporters. But um, is it okay then if we don't have any questions, if I talk a little bit, just a few more minutes about Christian nationalism? Absolutely, yes. yes. I gave a lecture on that recently, and so it's on my mind. Boy, <laughs> Uh, how much time do I have? Do I still have three or four minutes? You've got plenty of time. You've got plenty of time. We don't need right. to eat lunch. Okay, yeah. You, it, it isn't lunchtime yet, is it? Okay. <laughs> um, here's the thing. Christian nationalism is being talked about in many different circles. You can go online. Those who condemn it, those who say it's being, you know, Christians are being falsely accused. So very quickly, what I do is this. I personally have never endorsed a political candidate or a political party, but obviously we should speak about issues that are biblical that impinge on politics because today everything is politics. So what I show is in this lecture that we believe in the separation of church and state but you can't separate the state from morality. So then I listed about eight different issues which are thoroughly biblical, which we should be speaking about, issues regarding sexuality. And uh, in the two books that you referenced, I even talk about trying to help parents to understand what to say if their child comes home and says, I think I'm trans. So that's a separate thing. So issues of sexuality. What about um, parental authority? The leftists believe that the education of children is too important a task to be left to uh, parents. 
and they should have no input. Uh, we have to be speaking to these issues. The parents have authority. And then I listed some of the other issues, certainly abortion, certainly issues even regarding the border. You know, people are confused regarding the role of government and the role of the church. And uh, I speak about that specifically in a book that you didn't reference, Pastor, and that is The Church in Babylon. But what I wanted people to take away is this, that among Christians, there's going to be a lot of disagreement. I'm not a Republican, I'm not a Democrat, but I am a Christian. So you have to look at the two platforms, you have to look at the two flawed candidates and say which one best represents my convictions. And then what we have to do is prove that our solidarity in Christ is even more important than our political solidarity. So if somebody votes differently than you do, there's no use having long discussions because oftentimes in the heated discussions, facts don't matter, but um, in Christ, we have to be unified. So that's a summary of a half hour lecture. Thank you. Do you have a question? Uh, no, I just thoroughly enjoyed what I was uh, watching and listening to. And uh, I, I do want to comment on one of them. You had mentioned, I think it was the first one, learn to stand alone. And I, I think that's so necessary right now. We're finding a, a remnant church. Um, you obviously have a thriving church here, uh, Pastor Joe. But as I look around the nation, we see more and more people that are separated uh, throughout communities. They're two hours away from anybody. And they're finding online church is where they're gravitating toward because they can't find a church that isn't woke. They can't find a pastor that's bold. Uh, you mentioned three different, uh, the green, what's the green light, the yellow light, and the red light. And, it, and you look at that and think, how many pastors are there that are, would be a red light pastor right now? Obviously here, it, but there's so few of them. And we do need to stand alone and learn to be able to stand alone in our convictions in the Lord. But at the same time, uh, the church is not to forsake the gathering together. And uh, where two or three are, are gathered together, then, then uh, uh, the Lord is in, our, in the midst of them. And I think um, the encouragement to be able to stand alone and be strong in the Lord is something that we need to really come to grips with. I appreciated everything you shared. Yeah. And... Um, well, yes, I think that one of the things that we have to do is, obviously, and you would totally agree, we have to hold these convictions, but very lovingly, because we're living in such a broken world, you know, even when it comes to same-sex attraction and all, and, you know, the gender thing and the trans thing. Somebody said, if you give your teenager a cell phone, uh, don't be surprised if they come to you and say, I think I'm trans. Because on the cell phone, there's all this encouragement. Your parents might not agree. So I'll be your secret counselor. I'm going to help you. So kids don't know what to do with their guilt because they're told that these things are normal when they know that they aren't. And so they think, well, you know, if I'm not at peace in my soul, maybe the answer is that I need to be trans or that I am trans or I'll give it a try. Absolute demonic disaster. But that's where the culture is at. So it's always important to hear people out, to hear their stories of brokenness, and then to speak into that with biblical wisdom and truth. Yeah. Awesome. You wrote uh, the book, When a Nation Forgets God, Seven Lessons We Must Learn from Nazi Germany. And uh, that's, a, that's another great book. Is there anything key in that book that you would give us as a tidbit of wisdom? Oh, my. Why do you get me started on topics that I enjoy talking about? <laughs> Let's talk about the relationship between chaos and order. 
Here you have, after World War I, of course, the democracy, the attempt at democracy, the Weimar Republic, didn't work. There were 20 different political parties all vying for power, and uh, so none had power. You have soup lines in Munich, you have soup lines in Frankfurt and other cities. Of course, because of the loss of World War I, you have a lot of poverty, violence. Hitler comes along and says, I'm going to restore order. The Reichstag burns, blames it on the communists. And Hitler was a socialist, you know, but he wasn't the communist kind. But anyway, the Reichstag burns. And so Hitler says, we're being overrun. What I want you to do is to give up all of your personal liberties, no freedom of the press, no freedom of assembly, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And when faced with a choice like that, people will always choose order. They're willing to give up their private rights in order to achieve order and in order to put things in place. You have, for example, what's happening over in Haiti. I wouldn't doubt that in Haiti, this is very ripe for a dictator because you can't have this kind of chaos with gangs ruling the city without needing some kind of military order. But the point is this, that Hitler was able to therefore set aside personal rights through various ways, become a dictator. And then we get to the issue of um, propaganda. What Hitler said is that with the right use of propaganda, you can make heaven appear like hell and hell appear like heaven. So propaganda is always based on an enemy. You have an enemy that you have to work against. It's based on anger. You have to get a, you have to get a culture angry. And um, then what you can do is you can use various streams, cultural streams, to bring that about. In Germany, there was nationalism, a wrong kind of nationalism, a nationalism that fused Christianity and the state in a way that was very destructive, because being a Christian meant that you were, first and foremost, a German. The flag was above the cross, and uh, so Christianity was used, and there's so much else that could be said. In today's society, what we are finding is the polarization of our culture, politically, religiously, when it comes to issues of trans. And so what we have to do is to ask ourselves, where do we draw the line? And what are we going to hold to? And what are we willing to give up in deference to the culture? So these are difficult issues. But uh, let me say one other thing. The people in Germany at the beginning, did not know where Hitler was leading them. I was in Austria last year, and as I stood there in that great square where Hitler stood on that balcony and gave his speech to 200,000 people, you can see it online, I've often thought to myself, if I lived in Vienna at that time, I would have been there cheering too, because here was stability, in the midst of chaos. But what we didn't see and what those folks didn't see is eventually where all of this would lead. And the churches had been weakened because of liberalism. You have Friedrich Schleiermacher with a name like that. He has to be German, I'm sure. And he taught that religion was a feeling of absolute dependence. Now, that was in the 1700s. Now, Trace that out today where you have spirituality without doctrine. It's a feeling of dependence. So the churches had lost the gospel, and they no longer were able to stand against the cultural resistance. I know I'm going around in circles, but I'm going to tell you one more story, and then we can uh, shut this down. On many occasions, it's been my privilege to lead a tour to the sites of the Reformation. In fact, I'm doing it one more time, God willing, this May, May 6th. We meet in Berlin, and then we go to Pot for a day in Berlin, then we go to Potsdam, then we see all the Luther sites. So here I am in Wittenberg, 
where Luther nailed the 95 theses, the church is there, the door is there, and uh, they're going to have a short service inside the church at noon. It's called a Gottesdienst. So the tour group leaves, but because I know some German, I stay. The pastor reads from the Old Testament in honor of, um, you know, the Jews. He reads from the New Testament in honor of Christianity. And then he reads from the Quran because he says, in this church, we honor all three of the world's religions. And buried right there is Luther. So you can see, and by the way, in 2017, I went around the country giving a lecture on Luther's view of Islam, a one-hour lecture. Fascinating stuff, but not for today. But the point is that the churches had lost the gospel. They had lost the willingness to suffer. And not seeing everything that's going to happen, they were overrun until the churches were totally Nazified, enamored with Lutz, with Luther, with <laughs> with the Hitler, I should say. I got, you know how you do dictation, somebody dictates, I got a dictation the other day from somebody, a text that says, uh, Dear Pastor Lucifer, it is actually Lutzer, and it's different from Luther, but anyway. <laughs> what we have to do is we have to pray for wisdom we have to pray for courage we have to pray for love and we have to see that what is happening around us to our children is devastating most children today grow up believing that god is a detriment to their freedom they don't understand the issues they're driven along by the media. So parents pray, seek God, because only God can save us now. Yeah, amen, amen. Well, thank you. I, I just want to give anybody else an opportunity to ask a question, maybe one or two, if you, if you have a question. Yeah, right, right here in the front. question is, uh, what do you feel about trying to be a witness for Jesus on social media? And specifically in my case, um, I have a very, very good U.S. representative who's a Mary Miller, and she's a conservative Christian constitutionalist. And I often comment on her Facebook page, and I try to work in uh, being a testimony for Christ in that way. How do you feel about that? Oh, I think that's great. And you know what else? Mary Miller is a good friend of ours. Whenever she was in uh, Chicago, she brought, you know, the, the Miller family. And uh, what a wonderful representative she is. And I've met with her in Washington, too, with some other people of the House of Representatives. I have to tell you this about Mary Miller. She and her husband raised their kids without television. They read books. What a radical idea. Should we be shocked that her kids turned out fine? So, absolutely. The problem with social media is, you have, if you say something wrong, you have everything breaking out on you because we're in the midst of a very angry nation. But if you can be positive, if you can add something and mention her and commend her, absolutely, that's fine. You know, social media can be used for good, but um, it's dangerous territory. Thank you. I was handed um, a question. It's a two-part question for you. Uh, what are your thoughts on the violence in, um, in Chicago? And does Moody have an outreach aimed at the inner city? 
Uh, the answer to the first is regarding the violence in Chicago. You must understand the, the intrusion of cultural Marxism. Marx believed that human beings are a reflection of their environment. Change the environment, you change the human beings. You know, uh, private property is the cause of wars and the cause of fights. Take it all away, give it to the state, and everyone will live together in harmony. And there won't even be any need for laws. And even the state will wither away. Wow. How's that working out? So the whole idea is that the only reason people do evil is because of oppression. Get away from the oppression of family. Get away from the oppression of God. And uh, people are just going to live together. So let's see that trickle down to defund the police. A couple of years ago, a police officer here in the city told me, we arrest people, and before we have the paperwork filled out, they're back out on the streets. Because after all, police are oppressive, jails are oppressive, and so that's where we are at. And so you have violence in Chicago. And if you speak about it, you could be maybe even called racist or whatever. So that's where we are. And... Uh, Unfortunately, it's not getting better. Now, Moody. Moody Church began a ministry, so it's not directly under the umbrella of Moody Church, although it's still under the direction of our elders, entitled By the Hand Club for Kids. I urge you to go online and to see this ministry that's now over 20 years old. It's phenomenal. I could talk about it. I remember how it began at the Moody Church with 15 students. The other thing that um, Moody Church has done is it has helped other churches that are dealing directly with the migrant crisis. So uh, there are those reach outs to the city. Of course, we also have a pastor who spends time connecting with city officials and so forth. So, And the new pastor is Pastor Philip Miller. I encourage you to listen to him. I think he'll be a great blessing. And, you know, when you introduced me, you said I was the speaker on three radio programs. Right now, it is two because Pastor Miller, after being at Moody Church for three or four years, has taken over the Sunday morning service, obviously, which is the Moody Church Hour. So you will hear him. But Running to Win continues as it has been under my leadership and preaching. And so... I do want it, but it's only right that Pastor Miller have the Moody Church Hour, which is really our Sunday morning worship service. Well, Dr. Luster, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to share with us. And could you close us in prayer and pray for the families and individuals that have gathered here to this conference? I certainly can and delight. Father, we need your help. There are parents that are at this meeting today and grandparents who are grieving over children who have taken the wrong path, over those who are deconstructing, those who have chosen their own way, those who perhaps even have come to faith in Christ but seem to have jettisoned it. Lord, make the church that I've been speaking to there in Indiana a strong church, a loving church a church that people can trust. I pray, Father, for this ministry for the rest of today as they continue to meet. And we ask that you will help us to run the race of life successfully all the way to the finish line. We pray in Jesus' blessed name. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, Dr. Lucer. Well, we're going to take our lunch break now, and if you'll be back here at, what, 1.30? Jack Hibbs is going to uh, greet us. Uh, a lot of things going on in his ministry, so be sure and be back by 1.30. Bless you.
Hello. Now that you're all full of beef and unbelief, that's a little funny saying from D.L. Moody many years ago. He said he he didn't like to have uh, afternoon and evening services because people came back and they were full of beef and unbelief. (laughs) Just curious, uh, some of you are here because you've heard about the conference and you you see certain guest speakers online, follow them. Uh, how many of you are here because of Tom Hughes? And Great. Wonderful. How many of you are here because of Dr. Lutzer? Anybody? Oh, fantastic. And how many of you are here because of Jack Hibbs? Some of you raise your hands every single time. And then and Tommy Ice, of course, he's, yeah. uh, actually, I know the truth. Some of you are here just because of the cookies, right? <laughs> yeah. I've heard that. Well, we're so blessed. And if you uh, could make sure that we have your contact information, I promise you we're, we're not going to send out any solicitations. We just need that for, like, next year's. Prophecy Conference or any update on some prophetic issues, we'll send that out. But that's the only way we get the information out is by word of mouth and then sending it by by email. So you are our advertisement. So what a wonderful turnout we've had this year. Well, Jack Hibbs, what a guy. He, uh, senior pastor for 34 years at Calvary Chapel, Chino Hills, and his, his teaching is heard on just so many, so many venues, uh, not only in America, but throughout the world. He's heard in Europe and the Middle East and Australia, Hawaiian Islands, just all over the place. He's got a great passion for the study of the prophetic word and expositional teaching of the word. He is, serves on the board of the Research Council in Washington, D.C. with Tony Perkins. Uh, he just has a great ministry, a real-life network, his own TV network. His, his wife, Lisa, have two daughters, and they live in Southern California. And uh, when I asked Jack, he's been here live in a person before, and he wants to come back again sometime, but he's, he's so busy. But someone said, I, I don't know how accurate this is, but... <laughs> But I heard that he's been put on a no-fly list. (laughs) So he'll have to ride a bicycle here or something. If the globalists have their way, we'll all be riding bicycles, right? But uh, Jack did this video for us. And it's not long, but then I want to do some things uh, right after the video. But when he did that prophetic update and challenge and greeting to us a week ago Thursday, I saw him the same day he was being interviewed on uh, Newsmax, and he had the same clothes on. So I said, hey, that, that, that's convenient. He's just... And then I noticed the next day he changed his, his subject on Sunday morning from he's going through Romans. He decided to do a, an update, a prophetic update. I think it right after he did his update for us. So maybe we stimulated him a little bit. But what a wonderful pastor. Uh, he's, what can you say? He, he, he's just a gifted to the body of Christ. He's got this uh, new book out called Living in the Days of Deception that we have out there on the book table. And uh, Frank Turek, who is a Christian apologist, in fact, he was here on the campus of Purdue not too long ago, very articulate. He interviewed Jack on this book, and uh, Frank said this is one of the best books on deception he's ever read. And Frank would know because he has to deal with deception on the campus all the time. So let me, uh, let's go ahead and get this uh, video from, from Jack to us.
We do have some volume someplace. You can Stay tuned. We've got some good techies back there. And how they did the, the Zoom with Dr. Lutzer while at the same time live streaming this, I don't know. I have no idea. But they, they did that, so they'll iron out this bug. Well, Pastor Joe and all of you there, God bless you guys. I feel so bad because I have to tell you, with my heart, with my spirit, I'm with you. Love what Pastor Joe's doing. Love what you guys are doing. And love the fact that you're Little gathering louder. together. Thank God for you Up. to study Bible prophecy. Isn't it amazing? There should be more Bible prophecy teaching conferences and sermons going on now more than ever before because we've never been this close to the Lord's return. And you might say, well, I have, my, I have a different view, Pastor Jack, of eschatology. Well, whatever your view is... <laughs> It's closer today to being fulfilled, okay? For those of us who are correct and we're expecting the rapture at any moment, then we're so close. For those of you who are not so correct and you think it's going to happen at the end of the tribulation, well, guess what? You're one day closer. Uh, you're closer than you think, my friends. You guys, I love the, I love the theme verse of what you guys are doing uh, this week or this weekend. And Luke chapter 21, verse 28. Now, when these things begin to happen, look up, lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. Everybody knows, right? I assume that you know that this is taken out of what is uh, choreographed with Matthew chapter 24 and uh, Mark's gospel chapter 13. And this is Jesus, his response, that when the disciples asked him, after showing him the temple, and it was kind of a, you got to admit, when you read Matthew uh, 24, even the latter end of Matthew 23, before chapter 24, you kind of, you kind of see the excitement of, of the disciples, the, the future apostles. They're pretty pumped up because, friends, I don't even know this or not, but when you read the Gospels, Jesus didn't spend much time in Jerusalem, hardly ever. He was almost always in the Galilee region. Three times a year, Jesus went to the required feast of a Jewish male to go to those feasts three times a year, and then he got out of town. They would go to Jerusalem for those three particular feasts of Moses at that time of the year, uh, and then he would leave. And so while he was there, the disciples thought it would be a great idea because no, remember, they're, they're Galileans. So for them, it was like country boys going to New York City, you know? And so when they got there, they wanted to show him the buildings of the temple. Of course, Jesus, of course, the disciples knew about the building and the structure of the temple and the surrounding support facilities. It was awesome. But to get a chance to see, I mean, it's kind of like you getting a chance to see the Grand Canyon again. You don't take it lightly. It's a big deal. And so they were telling them, look at all, look, look at the, and it's so beautiful. And look at the adorning. Luke's gospel tells us that they wanted to stress to him how beautiful everything was. And then Jesus drops this remarkable uh, time stamp bombshell that is actually the foundation of your conference. And that is Jesus basically saying, when you combine the gospels together, they asked him three questions. When he said to them, you see these stones? And he's referring to the temple as well. Not one stone's going to be left upon another. That shall not be thrown down. That so shocked them that their response was a threefold question. When they left the Temple Mount area, they went over to the Mount of Olives, and they sat down, and they asked Jesus a three-part question. When is this going to happen? How can this be? And what will be the sign of the end of the world, of your coming? How is this going to happen? Jesus then breaks forth into what is known as the Olivet Discourse. And 
he gives, and it's a beautiful thing, he gives you teachings from those chapters that are expansive, expansive, a broad net. He talks about things that were going to happen shortly after the temple would be destroyed. We now know, of course, 70 AD. And he marches outward from that moment forward with an, a general theme. Be watching. Be ready. Be alert. Look up. This is to be for every generation of believers. Don't let anybody fool you, friends. There'll be those who will say, uh, you know what? I don't believe in the doctrine of imminency. I've got to, I don't think Christ can come back until all these other things happen. The Antichrist has got to come. All these prerequisites. Listen, Jesus didn't teach that. Jesus taught expansively with a broad net, the entire all of it discourse manifest, which means from the going down of the temple, a clock is going to start ticking. Technically, friends, it's the last days. When the temple was destroyed, it commenced the time clock, as it were, of the last days. The last days began 2,000 years ago. And from that moment onward, you read the Olivet Discourse, and there's elements about that that you recognize very, very well. And then there's elements about it that hasn't happened yet. And that shouldn't confuse you. Just know that it's a broad net that Jesus spreads. But the cool thing is, intermingled among that are these precious promises to each and every generation. When you see these things begin to happen, notice he didn't say when you see these things finish. That's so important. He said when you begin to see these things begin to come to pass, look up. So when you see this stuff starting, get ready. So, wow, don't you sense now more than last year's conference the need to be ready? But I'm going to push it. Let's go beyond verse 28. Let's go, for example, to Luke 21, one of my favorites, verse 36. This is awesome. Check it out. In the same sermon, Jesus says, verse 36, Watch, therefore. Pray always. Oh, by the way, I should say, he just gave you a ginormous list of catastrophes that are coming upon a Christ-rejecting world in the end-time uh, scenario, which certainly in, uh, includes the tribulation period. And then Jesus inserts what some might say is, in fact, a parenthetical insert, where he puts in verse 36, watch, therefore. So in light of everything I just got done telling you, watch. And pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass to stand before the Son of Man. So you watch with all that's going on. And as you see these things uptick, global catastrophes, global insanity, wars and rumors of wars, Sicknesses that are plaguing people by fear and illness with no cure. False religions taking the lead. False Christ. False messiahs. Global upheaval. The world being in a state of anxiety to the point that people don't know what to do. Jesus does this remarkable, remarkable freeze frame and he says, oh, but you know what? You, you, you guys watch, therefore, and pray that you're counted worthy to escape all these things that are coming. Have you ever been labeled by people who say, oh, you guys believe in the Lord coming back as you guys are just trying to escape the evil, escape the danger, escape the tribulation period? What kind of a knucklehead would want to hang around here with evil? the tribulation period, and all the catastrophe. Of course we want to escape it. Jesus said it himself. Hey, everybody, I would say, let's escape it. How are we going to escape it? He says, be, you got to be worthy to escape it. And that makes us nervous. Well, how am I going to be worthy? Simply means this. Make sure that your life is found in Christ. Be found in Christ. 
like you are today, I trust, walking with Jesus, trusting in Jesus, yielding your life to Jesus, praying, seeking him to see what's next for your life, what's next on the horizon. Lord, with what time I've got left, use me. Be in Christ, right? Don't get with your love. Don't get sloppy with your theology. Watch out who you're listening to. Don't be a gigantic spiritual trash can, so to speak, that you're listening to that guy and listening to the other guy, and this woman wrote this book about that person that saw this vision. This guy over here saw this thing. Don't do that. Friends, listen. Jesus said it in two different ways. Be careful how you hear and be careful what you hear. More than ever, I know I'm going to sound like a dinosaur right now and i got to wrap this up, but more than ever, you guys, it's not a virtue to have a gigantic set of Mickey Mouse ears taking in all of what's going on. It's best to become very selective with your hearing to make sure that what you're listening to is biblically based 100%. Because Jesus said, I'm coming at an hour that you don't think that you're not aware. So be ready. Jesus said, I'm coming at a time that will be like a thief in the night to those who are not watching. But you, my brethren, that day will not come upon you as a thief in the night. For you yourselves know perfectly that the things that happen, happen at night. Those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But you are not of the night, but of the day. So that that day will not overtake you as a thief. That was Paul's announcement to Timothy. So this is a thrilling time. We've never been this close. So where are we now? Well, we know this. The United States has never been this close to ditching the nation of Israel. God forbid, but if while we're still here, certainly under this particular administration at this time, if the United States ditch divorces itself from Israel, it will be for the first time in American history. Then I would expect God to divorce himself from America. I based on Genesis 12, to say the least, Genesis 12. What does that mean? Well, if God ditches America, that means that you can expect this country to fall under the judgment of God in what is known as national sin. God will judge national sin. It doesn't mean he's judging your sin because your sin was already judged at the cross. But just like Daniel, who loved God, was carted away to a godless Babylon, right? America may suffer the same fate, even though you and I might still be here. We don't know. We could get raptured today, I hope. But if not, we have to prepare for what's coming. What does that mean? That means we do the best we can. We vote biblical worldview. We don't sit it out. We get involved. We pray. We stand against wickedness. We do righteousness. We look up, but we march forward. Whatever's in store, friends, is still, still protected under a very special clause in the Bible. Romans chapter 8, verses 28 to 30, or 31, if I remember right is still in effect, that no matter what happens, all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purposes. And then he goes on to define, based upon his own foreknowledge, God has predestined, which means you don't need to worry about a thing, but it does mean that you and I need to be responsible with the faith that we have. Faith is a verb, and we need to put it into action. We love you guys. Someday I'll make it there. If not, I'll see you in the air. Pastor Joe, thank you for the opportunity. I love you, brother. Stand strong. God bless you guys. Take care. Jack prayed a wonderful prayer before Christmas a few weeks ago. And uh, we have this prayer we'd like to uh, show you. And then Jack makes a comment about that because he, he received some flack from, from some people. So here's his prayer.
Almighty God and Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, together we come before you in humility as a people in need of your forgiveness, your mercy, your goodness, and your grace. For these 250 so years, our fathers in this Congress have prayed for your guidance and protection. And so we stand here in humble petition that you today might do the same, that this nation and its unparalleled constitution, your great gift to all freedom-loving people, might be renewed here and across this land as a beacon of hope to all who seek peace. I ask you today, Father, to bring to us a great awakening of righteousness and confidence in you, who alone is mighty to save. Hear my cry in this hour of great need that we might be humbly blessed before you in the repentance of our national sins. You, Almighty God, are the source of all wisdom, and there is no wisdom but that which comes from you. So please come upon those here who are the stewards over the business of our nation with your wisdom, which comes from above, and with your holy fear, knowing that your coming day of judgment draws near when all who have been and are now in the authority will answer to you, the great judge of heaven and of earth, for the decisions that they make here in this place. I offer this prayer, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Son, your Son, and our crucified Savior and resurrected Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 And the chair has examined amen. the journal we, of the last day's proceedings. We agree and with that prayer. And uh, we, in fact, we have a copy of this prayer for you if you'd like to pick it up at Jack's table. And if we run out, we'll copy some more off. But uh, he received flack from this prayer from a handful of senators, uh, and they sent him a scathing letter. And so here's Jack's response. They condemned my prayer. Number one, who was I praying to? Let's find out. I said, let's pray. Almighty God and Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, I broke three rules. I didn't even know that. I found out later, first sentence, three rules broken. And I was chastised. By praying that, you're evangelizing. So I'm a Christian. Who am I supposed to pray to? I'm supposed to pray, keep it generic. Saying Father is gender insensitive. Not to my God, it's not. Not to my God, it's not. He says to us, Listen, we didn't call him Father. He told us to call him Father. Together we come before you in humility as a people in need of your forgiveness, of your mercy, of your goodness, and of your grace. What's wrong with that? For these past 250 years, our fathers in this Congress have prayed for your guidance and your protection. And so we stand here in humble petition that you today might do the same. That this nation and its unparalleled constitution, your great gift to all freedom-loving people, might be renewed here and across this land as a beacon of hope to all who seek peace. I ask you today, Father, to bring to us a great awakening of righteousness and confidence in you, who alone is mighty to save. Hear my cry in this hour of great need, that we might be humbled before you in true repentance of our national sins. I had no idea what that was going to create. To be told that our nation has nothing to repent of is shaking your fist at Almighty God. But that's what some of our leaders believe. Well, you, Almighty God, are the source of all wisdom, and there is no wisdom but that which comes from you. So please come upon those here who are the stewards over the business of your nation with your wisdom, which comes from above, with your holy fear, knowing that your coming day of judgment draws near when all who have been and are now in authority 
will answer to you, the judge of heaven and earth, for the decisions that they make here in this place. I offer this prayer to you, Father, here it comes, in the name of Jesus Christ, your only Son, our crucified Savior, and resurrected Lord. And so that made it onto every news outlet. But it's, but look, this is pop, this is normal. This is normal. Amen. Well, we just pray that uh, the Lord answers Jack's prayer and all of our prayers because we're praying the same thing and that he would, uh, he would remove those from power and influence who refuse to be sensitive, at least to his, his leading and promptings. And, and those who put that fist in God's face, we pray, Lord, just remove them from power and influence, exalt the righteous. There are a few handful of righteous in Congress and Senate, so we need to lift them up and pray that God protects them and uses their voice in a mighty way. He's got to do it. As, as Dr. Lucer said, as Jack said, as Tom Hughes will say, and Tommy has said, if, if God doesn't come through for us, well, all we can say is, well, what we can say is, as believers, it's praise the Lord because it's a win-win for the believer no matter what happens. But we're trusting the Lord for one more outpouring of his spirit before the night comes and we can work no more. Well, we'll make a little transition here uh, to Tom Hughes. He's coming and to get set up here. And uh, so if you want to take a quick stretch break, we'll get... and. Then he'll be with us.
Okay. All right. We are blessed to have Pastor Tom Hughes with us this afternoon, all the way from Southern California by way of Israel. Pastor Tom is a pastor, expert on Bible prophecy. He's former pastor of the 412 Church in Southern California, and he has been teaching Bible prophecy for over 30 years. He regularly appears on TV, radio, and internet programs, including the popular Hope for Our Times. The World News Briefing is every Thursday night. In fact, every Thursday night, we have a men's study here. And after the men's study, maybe I shared this with you. I share it with somebody. After the men's study, at 9 o'clock our time, at 6 o'clock time, we do a special briefing on uh, his channel. So depending on what time frame you're on, you can pick that up every Thursday evening. I pick it up after a men's study. So I'm blessed for a men's study, and then I go home listening to you. So uh, I feel sorry for you. <laughs> <laughs> so he and his wife Jackie are with us, and so we're just blessed to have Tom back with us. He was here a couple years ago. So we missed you. Where you been? I've been traveling too much. <laughs> Good to see you. Thank you, Pastor Joe. And, and um, uh, let's see, where's my wife? I was going to ask her if she'd get me another bottle of water because I'm going to finish this one. Well, I don't know. If she loves me, she'll show up with water, right? <laughs> so we'll see. We're going to find out what happens. Well, this is embarrassing. Uh, you want to know why this is really embarrassing? Okay, so I have been like all over, you know, traveling all over the place, and um, and my mind. Oh, wow. <laughs> wow, that hurts. So my mind is really, it's I'm really all messed up. So I was in. Uh, Australia, New Zealand, Hawaii, Minnesota, Orlando, Israel for a couple of weeks, and then got home, I think, Wednesday, and caught something my last day in Jerusalem, and I'm here. So if I don't, if I don't appear here, it's because my brain is not totally here. So, so bad is it, I forgot my Bible. I, I realized this morning, because we got in about midnight last night to the hotel, and I realized this morning because I take it everywhere I go. Well, I had to stop by my office before flying here, and my Bible, I know where it is. I left it on my desk. So my wife's Bible. I got my wife's Bible. She had to bring me water. I don't, I don't know. What, where am I? No, I'm <clears throat> I want to do something before we get started, though. I want you guys to do a shout-out to two people, because so many of you have asked me about both of these individuals uh, just in the last little while. Uh, Pastor Jack and James Cadiz. All right, so ready? So I'm just going to have you lift your hands, give a shout out to both of them as soon as I say something. Ready? So Pastor Jack, listen, these are your friends from, and Pastor James, these are your friends from Indiana. They've been talking about you, and they all want to say hi. So say hi to both of them. And we are having a great time here, and Pastor Jack, everybody just watch your video. It was outstanding. Okay, God bless you guys. See you Tuesday, James. Okay, I'll send that to him in a little bit, because I'm not going to do it right now. So uh, anyways, I, I think I'm ready. Let me, let me get set up here. Man, my mind is so all over the place. What am I talking about? That and that, right? Okay. So how much, uh, Pastor Joe, when do I have to be finished by? I got to make sure I don't go over. <laughs> Where, anybody know what time I'm supposed to be done by this session? Five o'clock? That at 2.30, that's 21 minutes. 250, 250. How many minutes is that? 
40? 40? Okay, my timer's on. So I better get moving. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for uh, the time to, that you've given us to be here. Pray for your blessings uh, on uh, the rest of this conference. We thank you for the great work you've already been doing here. May you be glorified in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So this is, I like to set up with a little bit of humor, uh, but my message is titled, The Setup for the Mark of the Beast. And in your, your uh, program, the itinerary has me speaking on technology and the mark of the beast, but I changed that. So I didn't know I was speaking on technology, I think, until yesterday. And I said, oh, oh no, what am I going to do? But this is what happened. Um, I look at technology, and it's all over the internet. Uh, everybody's worried about it. We all hear about AI, things are coming, they are not looking good. That's, I, in fact, I have a round table coming up with a few of my tech friends in a couple of weeks, do these things all the time. But we're well aware. You can go anywhere on the internet, you're gonna find out about it. People on the left are worried, people on the right are worried, atheists are worried, Christians are worried. The only people that aren't worried about it is the World Economic Forum and the UN and the people inventing everything out of Silicon Valley. But we have all of the info, it's out there for tech and we can see what's coming. And they're, they're building a system that there is no escape from. So what I wanna do is show what's going on right now and why without what's happening right now, it doesn't matter how good the technology is, they wouldn't get the compliance uh, that they need. And so we're gonna go look at that here. Today, but I'd like to start out with a little bit of humor. So this really did happen. A man tried to rob a bank after paying $500 to a wizard to make him invisible. It's true. I thought this was a Babylon Bee thing. I had this on my You Can't Make This Up program a few weeks ago. This really did happen. He, uh, it didn't work. He goes to a bank. He literally went to this bank and started taking money out of people's hands. So finally, they, 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 they caught him, and it's like, I mean, you would think the guy would have looked in the mirror and said, hey, I can see myself. Maybe it's not working. He didn't do that. So I just thought I'd show you some things that are kind of crazy. Um, if you are interested in following my ministry, it's Hope for Our Times, uh, website, app, Rumble, YouTube, all of those different areas where you can find me. I also have a newsletter that we send out. The newsletter is free. If you're interested, you can... You can uh, do the QR code right while you're sitting there if you want, but it is free. We try to send it out every Monday, but if I'm traveling a lot, then it doesn't go out as often. Uh, but it's free, you get it. Uh, often, I, I usually include a video with it, uh, just a little, uh, uh, basically a devotion through the book of Psalms is what I send out. So if you're interested, uh, you can follow me there. I have, was a, served as a senior pastor for a church in Southern California for the last 20 years. I resigned from that position on December 31st. My, the last thing I did at the church was with Brandon Holdhouse. I did my annual New Year's Eve prophecy update. And then uh, prior to being at that church, I was on staff with Greg Laurie for a number of years and got my start at Calvary Chapel at Costa Mesa. But uh, I believe the Lord was calling me to do this like full time. I believe the time is short and I, I feel like I'm gonna run the race we can all see the finish line. And a runner, when he sees the finish line, he doesn't slow down, he doesn't pull up a chair. What he does, he's running harder when he sees the finish line than he did all of the other laps around the course. And friends, I believe we are there. So uh, it's, I, I wanna give it everything I got. We have a dark world and we have an opportunity to be light in this dark world. Okay, with that, let us... Let's get going as we look up at the setup for the mark of the beast. Think of this. Rome never fell. It became a church. British Empire never stopped. It became a bank. Uh, we're going to look at four things in our time here. Um, the players, their intentions, their problem, and then the takedown. In Micah chapter 2, it's one of my favorite passages over the past year, because it's very telling for where we are right now. Micah chapter two, Michael was prophesying not to our time now, but to the time in which he lived. And he's letting Israel know judgment is coming. Very interesting. He writes this, chapter two, verses one and two. Woe to those who devise iniquity, 
and work out evil on their beds. At morning light, they practice the evil. So we can picture them. They're laying in bed at night. They're thinking, what can we do? I know we, we, can, we, can, oh, we can create all kinds of destruction. That's what's happening in Micah's day. And why do they do this? Verse one goes on and says, because it is in the power of their hand. Because they have the power of the law that they make behind them. They can cause Pastor Jack to be put on the no-fly list. That's the type of thing Micah was dealing with way back then. My friend John Haller says, prophecy is pattern. What happened before will happen again. And that's what's going on. Continues, listen to this. Verse two, they covet fields and take them by violence. Also houses and seize them. So they oppress a man and his house, a man and his inheritance. They take everything. Uh, regardless of what your thoughts are on Trump, what happened in New York is very telling when you look at Micah chapter two, verses one and two. They plot, they stay awake at night. How can we devise our wicked plans? They will even take everything you own and the inheritance that your children are supposed to have. They will figure out a way to do it. And it is happening. So we're gonna look at these, the players, their intentions, their problem, and then the takedown. All right, so regarding the players, um, I love this quote from Frank Zappa. How many of you are old enough to remember Frank Zappa? <clears throat> when my voice cuts out, do me a favor, just pray, right? I'm hoping it lasts. I have to last two sessions in a row, but here it is. Uh, Frank Zappa, the, illusion, the, the spiritual giant he wasn't, but um, <laughs> still this is very insightful. The illusion of freedom will continue as long as it's profitable to continue the illusion. At the point where the illusion becomes too expensive to maintain, they will just take down the scenery, they will pull back the curtains, they will move the tables and chairs out of the way, and you will see the brick wall at the back of the theater. We are in this place of illusions. When I was, let's see, 20 years old, 21 years old, 22 years old, I was in my young 20s, I had a gardening and landscape business. And I was a drug addict and a whole lot of other stuff. And, uh, I would, if you could vote in high school on who was the most unlikely to succeed, it would have been me. So I, it's, it's true. Um, but I learned something when I was in my young 20s mowing lawns. And what I did, I had a real company advertising uh, lawn service or landscape, and people call me for an estimate. This is in the early 1980s. And I realized something. I started a dummy company, and it worked. And my dummy company would get a phone call for the same company that I just put a bid on. I'd have one of my friends go out <clears throat> and give that person a bid. The chances of me getting the job went up exponentially because I would, they would now have two bids competing. They weren't, it was me. Listen, this is how we are being played. We, you can look at the right, you can look at the left, you can look at all these different dynamics that are going on and telling you there's a global agenda behind all these different things. If at, in my young 20s, as a guy who, a kid who mowed lawns, I could figure that out, believe me, the Klaus Schwabs, the Henry Kissingers, the Bill Gates of the world, they, they, they know what they're doing. Regarding the players, um, any of you ever see the movie Fiddler on the Roof? Oh, this is, this is my kind of crowd, right? I love that movie. <laughs> So you remember the scene where Tavia, he's, if I were a rich man, remember that scene? <laughs> um, in Hebrew, my friend David Tal told me, he actually says, if I were a Rothschilds. He said they were, he, they were taking a shot at the Rothschilds. Very interesting. Um, you look at the, the, who the players are. We know the obvious um, the Rockefellers, the Rothschilds, Soros, uh, Kissinger was. 
Klaus Schwab, Bill Gates, Yuval Noah Harari, the Pope, right on down the list. You can figure it out. George H.W. Bush, remember him? He stated that a new world order, a world where the rule of law governs in the conduct of nations, it would be under a credible United Nations, and it will, it will be a world order unlike the existing one, and in his words, we will be successful. Bill Clinton and John Kerry essentially said the same thing. In fact, John Kerry said, uh, how negative or positive the new world order will be depends upon what kind of new world order we create. Nancy Pelosi stated, you know, she's just a, she's awesome. <laughs> it's like, you know what the problem with saying that? People will cut that out that clip and say, Pastor Tom just said this. <laughs> she stated, it will be a new order for the centuries, for the ages, forever. Obama said the same thing. Um, we know about the young global leaders, right? The school that Klaus Schwab created. Uh, they kick out 150 new young global leaders every year. Among them, Mark Zuckerberg, uh, Jacinda Ardern, who was the former prime minister of New Zealand, who helped to establish the C-19 program. Um, we have uh, the wonderful prime minister of Canada, Justin Trudeau, what a guy, Angela Markell, David Cameron, Tony Blair, Vladimir Putin, and on down the list. But what we need to remember is it's the God of this world that's behind all of that. It's a spiritual dynamic. It's like we're on a chessboard and all the players are being moved around. Uh, what Satan needs, being the God of this world, he needs his minions. He needs his, his, his people to be able to carry out his plan. And uh, that's, that is what's happening. Uh, we can see how digital ID is being set up. Uh, we can see the a digital currency, a global ID. We're constantly being asked about it. Uh, when I go through an airport, I'm scanned. Uh, I have a, I, I mean, just walk up, I can walk up to a machine like this and keep going. When I come out, in fact, when I came out of Israel just the other day, coming into Los Angeles, literally I stood in front of the machine that long and walked right out. In fact, I walked right by somebody who said, welcome home, Mr. Hughes, great. I have a friend who has a flip phone. He does ministry for us down in Mexico. And he says, I'm not gonna do an upgrade on my phone because they're, they're gonna start tracking me. And my other friend, Steve, he said, well, they already are tracking you. No, they aren't. So he had to come back into the country. He walks up to a machine, takes his picture, unknown to him. He walks over to a desk, and they say, well, welcome home, Mr. Lortz. That's his name. They know everything. They know everything. I don't care. The flip phones and everything. We're being tracked. We're being ID'd. And by the way, this was sent to me. It was just out of uh, Australia. This is, this is really something. Um, my friend John Prescott from Australia sent this to me yesterday. There is a federal government bill in Australia that allows foreign troops and police onto Australian soil. And he said, What's, when I was there in Australia, you were being tracked everywhere. While you're going down the road, all the cars are going the same speed. I remember... Um, I know some of you guys will remember this. Uh, in the 60s, I had this race car set. Uh, there were different kinds you could have, but one of them was the Matchbox car set. Anybody remember those? Okay, with uh, the electric one. And the electric Matchbox was a little bit behind the Tyco one, but the electric uh, Matchbox one, it had a spring that ran throughout the whole track. And the car had a little needle that just, you put it on the track and went into the spring. You remember that? Okay, you guys got that? And so you press the button, but all the cars would go the same speed because they're all on the same spring that was running throughout the track. That's what it was like when we were in Australia. And we asked why. And they told us, you see that? You see, there's a camera. You go a little bit further, there's another camera, another camera. You get a ticket for speeding. You get a ticket if you're not wearing your seatbelt. 
it was absolute compliance. Uh, in New Zealand, it was the same thing. So these things are already out there and they are um, coming our way. And by the way, the, when you look at these globalists and what they are doing, you have the World Economic Forum, the UN, the World Health Organization, right on down the list, right? In the ni- uh, 1969, I think it was, Charles Manson murders. For, isn't this joyful stuff to talk about? <laughs> Listen, we'll get, we'll get to Jesus. <laughs> we will get there. But <laughs> it's got to be the setup, right? For what? Um, so the CIA was involved with Manson. This is wild. Some of you know that. And what they did, Manson was a a juvenile delinquent. He was always in trouble, had a really bad home life. I mean, it was bad when he was a kid. There's no doubt. But he was in a whole lot of trouble. When he was in jail one of the times, the CIA pumped him up with LSD, acid. And then they started monitoring him. And then they started giving him acid. And then just followed him to see what this would do. And then he, he moves to L.A., he starts this compound, he has all this weird stuff going on there with all these people in Hollywood. And I don't know where he got all of his acid, if he, it was continuing to come from uh, the, the CIA or if the people were out working and paying for it, or his, his, his people. But after he committed the murders, and he did, right? The CIA knew that Manson did it, the Los Angeles County Sheriff had an entire what was equivalent of a SWAT team back then ready to surround the compound he was at, and the L.A. County Sheriff was told to back off. They knew that Manson had done these things. And you go, he was an experiment. And you start looking, going, if they were doing that then, what are they doing now? So we know who the, the players are. We can see them. They're all over the place. We'll get back to Rothschilds in a few more minutes, by the way. But we have the players. We also, we have their intentions. Um, this is made popular by a book uh, by Bill Cooper. Some of you recognize that name called The Pale Horse, not The Pale Horse of the Book of Revelation, but the same concept was behind it. So, uh, But in there, he made this popular. It was a document from 1954. An actual document was from 1979, but it talks about the beginning of the Third World War in 1954. Uh, the document itself is titled Silent Weapons for Quiet Wars from May of 1979. In fact, I have a copy of this uh, document sitting on my, on my desk and um, given to me by, by uh, just a, a person. But it's very interesting. Um, what this document does is it lays out the plan for social engineering and the automation of society via silent weapons on a national and global scale. Information, technology, economy. We can now know we can throw in there viruses and on down the list. This document discusses social control, destruction of human life, those that are unfit to live in the plan uh, that they have. And to quote from it, the need to be sure that the information is secured from public scrutiny. So what do, we, what do you and I constantly hear? Misinformation, disinformation. As soon as things come across our computers, our phones, yeah, you, you know they're true, right? What happens? You, you're, you, all of a sudden you find out this website gets shut down or this person gets censored. Um, I'm much more careful now about what I say than I was three and a half years ago on a particular platform. The rest of them, I can say whatever I want. Um, but even our websites are getting monitored. So what it is, they've got to control the narrative. So again, this, this goes all the way back to 1954. Actually, you can go back further. I have another message on the Tower of Babel and go all the way back to the book of Genesis for similar things, but we're not going that far back because we don't have three days that I can talk. But this states that it must be understood that a state of domestic warfare exists between said person or group of persons and the public. The solution of today's problems requires an approach which is ruthlessly candid, 
with no agonizing over religious, moral, or cultural values. For a particular new recruit, it continues, you have qualified for this project because of your ability to look at human society with cold objectivity and yet analyze and discuss your observations and conclusions with others of similar intellectual capacity. Wow, these people are evil. This is a very short video um, from Davos 2024. It's gonna talk about their big concern. And their big concern, hate speech, misinformation, this kind of conference right here, right? Pastor Jack Hibbs, right? That, that, these things are their big concern. This is just a real short video. Community, the top concern for the next two years is not conflict or climate. It is disinformation and misinformation. That was a shorter video than I thought. I thought I was going to be able to get a drink of water. That didn't work out at all. <laughs> okay, this next video is longer, so I'm going to get a drink of water while this next video is playing. So, but what we are watching is, listen, their intentions are globalists, and so shut down anything that interferes with the narrative. They have a narrative. Hitler had to do it, and they have to do it, all right? So it's going on for a long time. Um, remember, that I think it was in the 70s, it might have been, I think it was in the 80s when this one came out. Uh, we are the world, we are God's, this is the best I can sing right now, because this, <laughs> this ain't working. Remember that? We are the world, we are God's children. <laughs> All right, well, here's, here's, a, here's one that's older than that. I remember the Coca-Cola commercial? Okay, let's watch, let's watch that one. I'm gonna be able to get a drink during this one. Of water. I'd like to buy the world a home and furnish it with love. Grow apple trees and honeybees and snow white turtle doves. I like to teach the world to sing. Sing with me. So I heard a lot of you singing along with that. <laughs> you just proved to me that you're as old as me. So, but with that, I mean, that commercial gets more and more emotionally engaging. Um, and so, you know, I cut it about, probably about 30 seconds short. It just builds and builds and builds. And you guys remember it. All these decades later, you're singing along. Listen, this stuff's been implanted in our brain. It's all part of the, the quiet war. It is about bringing about this global system, even with Coca-Cola. I'm sure the people at Coca-Cola were thinking, hey, we're just going to make it. We want to sell our product to the world. And everybody's talking about peace and harmony. Let's do our part. But there's an agenda behind it. Hence, what do we have? We have a world bank, a world court, world economic forum, world health organization, United Nations, global constitution, global currency, working toward a global currency, global constitution, global income tax, which is actually happening through the UN already, global military power, global ID number, global religion. Wow, this sounds rather biblical, doesn't it? Huh, I don't think it's a coincidence. So we have the players, their intentions, and now let's take a look at their problem. In 1948, with the creation of the transistor with William Shockley, those in position of power like the Rockefellers understood that with technology and enough money, it was possible for them to control the whole world with a push of a button. Hence, the Rockefeller Foundation funded a four-year grant uh, for the Harvard Economic Research Project. A year later, in 1949, the U.S. military got involved, and it was specifically the U.S. Air Force. 
if what's really going on is a military campaign waged against the masses. And I think it's pretty easy to prove if you start working this out uh, just a few, you know, a little bit further than what I'm going to do right now. Um, but, for example, um, Regina Dugan, uh, she was head of DARPA for a number of years, brilliant lady. DARPA is this defense arm of the U.S. military, basically is what it is. Uh, so Regina Dugan recruited Mark Zuckerberg. So Mark Zuckerberg is a guy in college. He, he invented what's now known as Meta, right? Previously known as Facebook. But he, he, he developed it as this college thing for people within the college he was at to be able to communicate with each other. What Regina Dugan recognized is, hey, this is brilliant. And so he was recruited. Do you know Klaus Schwab was also recruited by Henry Kissinger and a couple of guys in the, the Council of Foreign Relations? Another story for another time. But you start looking at this and going, wait a minute, you mean to tell me that, fo- that Facebook and Google also are part of DARPA? They're DARPA projects? Yes. All you have to do is go and look at who's on uh, their board of directors and who the main players are within their companies, and you realize, wait a minute, these people are military people here in the U.S. And you find out it's this way since their beginning. I, and listen, Facebook... Uh, I, I know so many Christians say, I will never tell the government all, I, I will never tell them this information. I'll never tell them that information. But you go on Facebook, you say, guess where I am for vacation, hello, right? Guess how many kids I have, here's all my children's faces and all these things. We've, what they've created is a place where all this information is voluntarily surrendered, joyfully surrendered. It's data. These are data collecting things. I know that sounds a little harsh, but that's the reality of the world we live in. It's data. Many of you have already heard this quote. This is by Mayar Amshal Rothschilds, who said, give me control over a nation's currency and I care not who makes its laws. What Rothschild had discovered was the basic principle of power, influence, and the control over people as applied to economics. The principle is when you assume the appearance of power, people will soon give it to you. Without needing to name any Rothschilds directly, this was the Harvard Economic Research Project's purpose to discover the science of controlling an economy. At first, the American economy and then the world economy. Its immediate aim was to determine what forces change economic structure, how the behavior of the structure can be predicted, and how it can be manipulated. They discovered that an economy obeyed the same laws as electricity. In other words, what they know is exactly how to control the masses by what they do with money. You can, hence, why do we have the government constantly printing up money? They know what they're doing. The people that are behind the printing of, of money, they know it will cause an economic collapse. But they also know they can shut off the supply and collapse these people over here or build up something over here for however long they want to. They can determine who's going to win a war. They can, they can help start a war based on how they handle the economy and dictate the direction that things are going. The problem, but here's the problem. The problem that these kingdom builders have is the the, uh, United States of America. And this is why there's so much hatred for the Jack Hibbs. There's so much hatred for a conference like this. There's so much hatred for anybody who says, make America great again. America is the problem for these kingdom builders. Builders. Let me give you an example. Many of you have heard of the New England Primer. Uh, in the, the New England Primer was the primary textbook uh, for elementary kids and younger, uh, going way back. In fact, by 1737, the New England Primer uh, was, was used throughout the colonies. 
It was more than a primer on reading. It was a handbook on life. And it was full of the Bible, specifically it was full of Christian doctrine. So the primer, you guys know what it is, right? A primer teaches you the ABCs and how to read. All right, okay, good. I didn't want to have to explain that one. Um, But in teaching the alphabet, the primer said, for example, A is for Adam. In Adam's fall, we sinned all. B was for Bible, heaven to find the Bible mine. C was for Christ, Christ crucified, for sinners died. So this type of teaching goes throughout the book to Z, Zacchaeus, he did climb the tree our Lord to see. It contained an alphabet of lessons for youth, which began like this. A, a wise man maketh a glad father, but a foolish son is the heaviness of his mother. B, uh, better is a child with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and trouble therewith. C, come to Christ. D, do not do the abominable thing. E, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Imagine today. Yeah, I mean, right? In the Indiana school, uh, the Indiana school system, you suddenly bring something like that. Can you imagine? Your grandchild or your child comes home from the public school. Guess what I learned today about E? Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Bring out the lawyers. I guarantee you that would happen in California. So what's the problem? The problem is America. That's why we see America stands in the way of this global system coming about. Let me show you this. Matthew chapter 12, just a few verses, beginning in verse 25. I have to read from my wife's Bible. Look at how tiny that print is. Can you see that? You see how small? You're you're falling asleep, so let me help you wake up. That is small. (laughs) Was I close to being right? No, I'm falling asleep. Verse, oh, this is so small. I need light. Uh. (sighs) That's exactly what I'm doing. I'm getting my phone with my light. There we go. Oh, I can see. But Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself will not stand. If Satan casts out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? And if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they shall be your judges. But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or how can one enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man, and then he will plunder his house? Wow, this is what's happening. America is the strong man in this global system. And the problem is the good that founded America and the Judeo-Christian principles. Again, you look at what happened to Pastor Jack. Now on the no-fly list. Did you guys know that? So somebody told me that during lunch. And so they said, Pastor James Cadiz had mentioned this yesterday. So I texted James just before coming in here and said, what is he? said sure enough, Jack's on the no-fly list. Over preaching Christ in a prayer, you look, you go, wow, the name of Christ. Satan knows he has to bind the strong man. All right, I'm almost out of time, so now I really got to hustle up. Uh, so the final thing is the takedown. Um, this is what we are experiencing now. It's the takedown. You want to see something funny before we get to the end? I promise we're going to end on Jesus, all right? All right? You want to see just something? To me, this is humorous. This is Tedros of the World Economic Forum saying, I never said we should do lockdowns. I never, what? I never said, right? This is wor- it's worth watching this video, just, just for the humor side of it. Let me be clear. WHO did not impose anything on anyone during the COVID-19 pandemic. That's funny. (laughs) Not lockdowns, not mask mandates, not vaccine mandates. We don't have the power to do that. 
We don't want to. <laughs> you sure are looking for it. What did he say right after that? <laughs> we don't want it. it. And we are not trying to get it. Our job is to support governments with evidence-based guidance, advice, and when needed, supplies to help them protect their people. I mean, that, come on. I mean, you got to admit that's humorous. We know the guy's lying like crazy. We didn't impose lockdowns. Oh, we didn't say anything about masks. Oh, no. Oh, I wouldn't do anything like that. I mean, seriously? Regarding earth worship, this is what's happening. Mother Earth is being lifted up. We're being made afraid of climate issues. We're being made afraid of you're going to die from a virus. They're, they're marketing fear is what they're doing. That's their product because they know the fear manipulates. Um, you remember uh, King Charles while he was Prince Charles? Uh, this is a statement he made at the COP26 meeting a few years ago, the climate meeting. Remember that one? Where he said this, climate change and biodiversity loss pose an existential threat to the extent we have to put ourselves on what might be called a war-like footing. Is waging war, I'm telling you right now, it's waging war. And we are watching the takedown of America because we are a problem for the global system. Um, then we have something like this. It's cold because it's hot, right? Uh, I mean, the absurdity of some of these things. Uh, but here's this one. We get to have the Mick Laws, a bug, a bug, a, a bug bird. I just thought I'd have a few things like this before we wrap up. Margaret Thatcher did wisely say, global warming provides a marvelous excuse for worldwide extranational socialism. So that's what's happening here. We are experiencing the takedown, right? Create the crisis, control the outcome. Um, so much so that even Mary Poppins is in trouble now. Mary Poppins gets new rating for use of racially offensive language in film. Mary Poppins, get rid of her. She's so evil. And I've got two minutes left. Want, want to watch one more video? Okay, this is uh, Anne Hathaway. Uh, yeah, you're going to really like this. This, yeah, exactly. Whoever said, uh, yeah, you're going to go, uh, let's do this. Ready? Here we go. Let's roll this. It is important to acknowledge that with the exception of being a cisgender male, everything about how I was born has put me at the current center of a damaging and widely accepted myth. That myth is that gayness orbits around straightness, transgender orbits around cisgender, and that all races orbit around whiteness. I appreciate this community because together, we are not just going to question this myth, we are going to destroy it. The walls built in fear will crumble, they will disintegrate, the old world will shatter, and the pieces that no longer serve will melt. A new world will emerge, forged from this community, from their size, from your seismic imperative message that love is love. There you go. But I mean, you can see uh, the words, if there's an attack on your speech, um, hence this is, this is the uh, letter, the formal complaint regarding Jack Hibbs after his prayer. You can find this online and see all the ridiculous accusations, but that is what's going on, right? Um, as, we look at, as we look at all of these different dynamics that are taking place, it's understanding of the players are in place, we know their intentions, um, you are the problem if you believe in Jesus. And, and we are experiencing, we are going through this takedown. But I want to encourage you. Um, they may have a takedown plan, but we have a going up. <laughs> Jesus is good. Jesus, amen. <laughs> they can do all they want. Jesus is going to call us home. Uh, the day is coming when we will hear the trumpet sound. Amen. Listen, think of this. I, I was just in Israel. It was absolutely fabulous. Um, uh, it was very sad on the one sense that 
uh, there were so few tour groups there. Uh, we were the only group in, in many different areas. We had about 50, 52 people with us. And um, we were in Capernaum, Caesarea. Uh, uh, I have, gosh, I have so many. Maybe I'll bring up some of the things in my next message. But it's, we got to remember this. Within the church, there's replacement theology, where the doctrine is that um, the church has replaced Israel. That's a false doctrine. Listen, Jesus is coming back. He's going to rule and reign from Jerusalem. When Jesus died on the cross, he was put into the grave. On the third day, he rose again. And then he ascended to heaven. He didn't get up to heaven. And this, a conversation like this did not happen. Well, dad, I, I won some and lost some. Here's what happened. I saved from, I saved from, uh, blah, blah, blah. I saved some sinners. However, I lost Jerusalem. I lost the Jewish people. I lost all of Israel. Satan won those things. I assure you there's no such conversation that ever took place. He died, he rose again, he ascended to heaven, and he is coming back. And we will see him, and we will be with him. Revelation chapter 19. He's coming on his white horse, and guess what? We are also coming. And on his, amen, he is king of kings, he is lord of lords. He's gonna stand on the Mount of Olives, the Mount of Olives is gonna split in two, and Jesus Christ will rule and reign. Jerusalem will always be here, the Jews will always be here, and Jesus is gonna be calling us home, and I can't wait, because I believe they have a takedown, but we have a going up. Lord, we thank you for your word. May you be glorified in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Tom. Hey, we just have a brief break. What time? Three, three or five? So, a little coffee break, three or five. Quick one. You start at three or five again? When does he start? start? Three o'clock. He starts at three? I only went 40 minutes. You guys made me. I look 41. All right. <laughs> <laughs> 41 minutes I went. That's all I went. Okay, this Scouts is Scouts honor. Whatever that means. Excuse, this should be a quick, quick break, and we'll be back here at three. We do have restrooms downstairs. Just a reminder.
and then uh, give them to us before t- tonight's evening session. We appreciate it. Tom Hughes is coming back, part two. <laughs> <clears throat> Okay, Joe. Pastor Joe, it's 3.02. What time do I have to be done by? <sighs> Midnight. <laughs> Don't say that. <laughs> I'll take advantage of it. What time? What time is it? Four? 3.50? 3.50. So I got 48 minutes. Yeah. Okay. Tommy's going to anch- anchor the afternoon session. All right. Sounds like a plan. Y'all ready? Like how my voice just cracked? That's because I'm still going through puberty. <clears throat> so, um, oh, let's go here first. So, uh, Pastor Joe said, talk about whatever, which is very dangerous. So, I decided just, I, I'm not, um, you know, I'm still trying to get my mind clear. So, I'm not going to go with just whatever. I will have some format to this time. Uh, but let's just, I, I want to have some hope and help us all to understand why you even study Bible prophecy. But first of all, as mentioned, I'd like to start off with a little bit of humor. Did you know that men are... Well, wait, let me start all over again. Ready? That was... Are you, now are you ready? Yeah. Okay, I'm going to show you a video. Okay, there, now you know. Got to pay attention. How many of you are men out here? <laughs> okay, all, you, you men will appreciate this. Your wives might not. Did you know that men are going to arrive in heaven 30 minutes earlier than women will? Bible says it, Revelation chapter 8, 1, when he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. Where where are you going? Hey, where are you going? So, do you like that? I don't, you know, I'm just, I'm just saying, I, it's a good interpretation of what? You're looking at me like I've done something wrong. <laughs> All right. So I have a, a book out, which many of you already know. I'm going to show this short video regarding the book and how it came about. I don't know if there's any left out there. We can only fit so much in our suitcase, and, and so it is what it is. But um, here's this short video on the book. Maybe. <coughs> Oh, it's not going to work. Oh, do you want to watch it? All right, let me see. I'm going to have to change this up here. Give me just a second. I think it's going to work. Maybe. I'm 100% almost positive it might work. I had a conversation with my dad. He used to work for a company called Teledyne back in the early 1960s. And he was invited to a party in the Hollywood Hills. He said all the big wigs were there, Henry Singleton and so forth. And he said an individual showed up and they're standing in the backyard looking into the city of Los Angeles. You see all these Uh, all these lights in the city out there and all the people that are out there. Someday, we're going to be able to control everyone. And he wasn't referring to just Los Angeles. Everybody is going to be identified. It's called the mark of the beast. Choosing the mark is really choosing to either live or die. There's no escape from the system. So that's that. how the book came about was literally a conversation I had with my dad. I had it over years, and, um, and then finally I recorded the converse, a conversation with him. Gosh, I'm thinking three years ago now, and it was just so fascinating. As he uh, was telling me about this company he worked for, which I knew growing up. You know, I was only two years old when that event happened, um, when he was looking at the L.A. Basin, and that's was we're going to control every person out here. And uh, in, in thinking where we are now, 60 years, 60-some 60 years later, thinking, yikes, things are coming about. Uh, but with that, in 2 Peter chapter 
chapter 1, verse 19. Let me get my flashlight out again. Peter writes, And so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place, until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation, For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Um, As Peter writes, we have this more sure word that shines as a light in the dark place. We live in a very dark world. And what I want to do is help us to have hope in this session and understand why Bible prophecy, all right? Because I think even with people who have been studying it for a long time. You get excited about it, but when somebody asks you why, you're like, uh, well, because Jesus is coming, and that's about as far as we are able to take it. But we know that it gives us great hope when it's put into the right, uh, given the right perspective. So with that, if I don't run out of time, I have 10 things I'll point out to to y'all. Number one, uh, Bible prophecy shows that only God can be trusted. So this was here at a school in America. Religious studies professor claims the Bible supports the idea that individuals can change their gender. This is nuts. Uh, there's, there's no scripture to back this up. When I read the article and what this professor is saying, a religious studies professor, I mean, that can mean almost anything. Unfortunately, this type of teaching is now in Christian schools too. Christian universities, bizarre things coming out of seminaries, um, just absolutely terrible. And then you have some things like this. Um, I don't know, maybe some of you attend this church I'm going to show you, but if you do, I would encourage you to flee from this church. All right, this was Super Bowl Sunday. It was a church, I think the church is in Ohio, I think. You guys know what it is? Okay, so they're going to play football with the Bible. I think that's the video I have. Call it in the air. It, uh, yeah, let's just go with tails. Would you like to kick or receive the Bible? I will receive. Tom wins the toss, chooses to receive the Bible. Patterson back with the kick. Oh, my goodness. Is that a touchback? Get a touchback. First time in 18 years there's a touchback for the kick. There you go, Miley Cyrus. There it is. Yeah, it's a church in Ohio, Cincinnati, Ohio. I've seen enough. Um, this is the reality of what is going on out there. And I want to encourage you to stay in the word. Listen, this book is going to keep you from being deceived, all right? Don't turn to the left or to the right. Uh, the first sign that Jesus gave the disciples when they asked him, what's the sign of your coming at the end of the age? Uh, They said, he said, be careful that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ. We have major deception that is taking place. And people ask me all the time, how do I keep from being deceived? It's this book. When Jesus came the first time, It was the Sanhedrin who voted to turn him over to the Romans to be crucified. The Sanhedrin was made up of Pharisees, which were politically conservative, and made up of Sadducees, which were politically liberals. Both of them turned Jesus over to the Romans to be crucified because Jesus wasn't the leader they wanted. They wanted somebody to overthrow Rome, Give them that kind of victory. Be very careful. And churches, to me, uh, are things are happening that are just absolutely appalling. But then again, we know that in the last days, within the church will be doctrines of demons. 
evil spirits, speaking lies and hypocrisy. This is talking about leaders and churches. 2 Timothy chapter 4, the people raise up for themselves teachers that will itch their ears, make them feel good. That's happening. So number one, Bible prophecy shows that only God can be trusted. Number two, it proves the Bible is God's word. Um, when I, when you, if you start looking at Bible prophecy, and you, if, you're, if you're honest, you're going to come to a conclusion and say, these things are all happening at the same time. It's not a coincidence. Or Erwin Luther was talking about these different things converging. Uh, Pastor Jack did. Right, Luke chapter 21, verse 28, one of my favorite verses. The conference. When you see these things begin to take place, look up and lift up your head because your redemption draws near. I sat down one day and started listing uh, uh, signs regarding the second coming of Christ. And I have over 150 of them now. I'm going to read them all to you. Not really, but just a few, Right? There'll be a restored Israel. Israel will be gathered in unbelief. Um, there will be a revived Roman Empire. There will be a global system, a global economic system, global political system, instant communication, the ability to control individual commerce. Listen, the Bible talked about all of these things. There are hundreds of signs. There, Dr. David Reagan says there were 105, 106 signs regarding the prophecies of the first coming of Christ, and a lot of them could be duplicated. So some uh, prophecy teachers will say there were over 300 signs of his first coming, but because many are duplicated, Reagan says there's about 105 or 106. Every single one of them were fulfilled. Every one of them. The Messiah be born in Bethlehem. He'd be called out of Egypt, and right on down the list. Joel Rosenberg says there's over eight times as many signs of the second coming of Christ as his first coming. That would put us well over 800 signs. And you start looking going, it is not a coincidence. God wants us to be eight times as sure because the deception is greater. The pressure to conform to the world is far greater than it's ever been before. So we have the prophetic word that shines as a light in the dark place. Um, what else do we know? Just a few of the other signs. Uh, there would be hatred against the Jews in Israel would significantly increase the closer we get to the time of the end. I don't know if you've noticed this, but anti-Semitism is off the charts. We were in Caesarea two weeks ago in Israel with the tour group, first, uh, first stop we had. And we're in the Hippodrome, and I had someone leading worship. And the only thing we posted online was not my message, it was just the worship. And it was, a, it was great. Everybody's just singing the song, enjoying worshiping the Lord. That was it. What happened on the, in the comments, we had over 500 comments within a matter of minutes. We had to shut off the comments. Out of the over 500 comments, only 20 were positive. All the rest were kill the Jews, hate the Jews, river to the sea, Palestine will be free. It was just nonstop, really, really wicked things. Anti-Semitism is being exposed. Um, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And it's in the hearts of people. I see it coming not just on the left anymore, but I'm watching the anti-Semitism on the right. Hence, stay in the word. Um, the, a few more signs. The world will be characterized by lawlessness. Seen anything like that? Violence. Uh, the world be characterized by people being offended. Jesus said, many will be offended because of me. You can't do something without offending anybody. Anything. Again, look what happened to Pastor Jack. I mean, I, a couple of years ago, some publication in the UK, I think it's called The Star or something like that. It's one of those you get at the checkout at the grocery store, those, you know, like the National Enquirer of the UK, I think, that's, I think that's kind of publication it is. But anyways, they wrote an article about me and a bunch of friends sent it to me and said, did you know this? I've never heard of the thing before. 
But apparently somebody found one of my videos and was offended at the things I was saying. Here's what was so ironic about it. The particular video they picked was that I said just that, that Jesus said many will be offended in the last days. And I'm thinking they were offended that I said they'd be offended. I mean, you can't get much more. I mean, I thought it was pretty funny. Um, here's a couple of other props. I'm gonna sh- uh, a couple of others, and then we'll move on to the next one. This is in the, at the Jaffa Gate. This was about a year ago. Um, so it's a little bit, it's very similar when I was there just last week at the Jaffa Gate. The Jaffa, how many of you have been to Israel? Okay, so you guys know this area. And uh, I want you to notice, everybody's just going around, right? I'm gonna, having a good old time, right? You see old people, young people, you see people of all different nations. Uh, things are just happening. That's about the extent of that video. Sorry, I did these videos on my own phone. I'm showing you this for a reason. So I want you to remember what you witnessed there, just people hanging around. Uh, when I was there last week at the Jaffa Gate, uh, I saw the same thing. There's all kinds of people. They're not so much tour groups, Muslims, Jews, and Christians. Nobody was living in fear, believe it or not. Um, we didn't go into Gaza. We didn't go up to Lebanon. But in Jerusalem, everybody was trying to get along. And, and it, was, it, was, it was like this. That train wasn't going, but there are a lot of people out. Young men, old men, young people, old people. And then there's this one. Okay. These are school kids. That's our teacher. Have a nice trip. So that was a year ago when I was there just last week. I'm walking through the exact same section in the Jewish quarter need near the Zion Gate. And I watched three different sets of kids that age come through with their teachers, all shouting and singing. And then went a little bit further into the area of the courtyard of the Jewish quarter where the, the great synagogue is and, and saw tons of school kids out there, all having a really good time. And, and the reason I bring this up is because of this passage. Both of these things I just showed you. Zechariah chapter eight, verse three, thus says the Lord, I will return to Zion and dwell in the midst of Jerusalem, and Jerusalem shall be called the city of truth, the mountain of the Lord of hosts, the holy mountain. Thus says the Lord of hosts, old men and old women shall again sit in the streets of Jerusalem, each one with a staff in his hand because of great age. The streets of the city shall be full of boys and girls playing in its streets. And I look at that and I go, okay, that prophecy that I just read isn't going to be fulfilled until the millennial kingdom. But what we are watching is things moving this direction, right? The prophecies that we read about, the signs, they're signs of the second coming of Christ. They project to what is going to come when Jesus comes back. And let me tell you, Jerusalem is going to be an amazing place to live. Prior to that, though, the rapture is going to take place. So I look and go like Pastor Jack Heck, I've been called an escapist. That's all right. I want to escape this place. And when I realize the things that are developing right now, not being, they're not yet fulfilled. And I see kids playing in the streets during wartime. And you look, you go, this is just an amazing thing as we progress toward that time. Okay, now I'm going to show you another one, all right? So check this out. Let me go over here. This is Psalm, uh, uh, Psalm 102. Two. I think it's Psalm 102. I know it's Psalm 102. I have to find it in my wife's tiny Bible again. Kind of like Lawrence Welk and tiny bubbles with his tiny Bible. Man. Give me a line. Now I can't even remember where it is. I have it marked in my Bible. I'll find it. I'll find it. 
Okay, I found it. This is so hard to see. I'm going to mark my wife's Bible right now because I'm going to lose my place. Don't tell her. I just marked it. Okay, good. Turquoise. All right. So check this out. This is a picture of, it's called the Temple Sifting Project. Um, In 1999, there was an Islamic organization group that removed 9,000 tons of dirt and debris from underneath the Temple Mount. I believe it was underneath, uh, right near the Al-Aqsa Mosque. And what they did, they dumped the 9,000 tons of dirt into the Kidron Valley. The Kidron Valley is just, it's between the uh, Mount of Olives and the Temple Mount. You have the Kidron Valley there. There was a group of uh, a couple of uh, archaeologist students that witnessed all this dirt being dumped into the, the valley there. Now, this to me is absolutely uh, fascinating. Still then, still, they have uncovered in this dirt and debris. The, the, the goal of the Islamic people is to eliminate the evidence of Jews having Jerusalem. That's the main goal, and destroy all these things but they dumped the dirt into the Kidron Valley, right? What they did is they did all the heavy lifting for the archaeologists so they didn't have to go out and dig it. Check this out. Since then, 616,103 uncovered artifacts that haven't even yet been published. Uh, My wife has a ring on her finger from the Temple Mount Sifting Project. Uh, they, they make some of the things they find into jewelry or whatever to help fund the sifting. I find it absolutely amazing. In their attempt to eliminate the thought of the Jews, they made it much easier to prove that the Jews had the land of Jerusalem, uh, of Zion. Now, where's this going? That's a good question. I have no idea. I just want to no. Psalm 102, listen to this. Verse 12 But you, O Lord, shall endure forever and the remembrance of your name to all generations. You will arise and have mercy on Zion for the time to favor her has come. Yes, the set time has come for your servants take pleasure in her stones and show favor to her dust. Literally, your servants delight in her dirt. That's so fascinating to me. So the nation shall fear the name of the Lord and all the kings of the earth your glory for the Lord shall build up Zion. He shall appear in his glory. He shall regard the prayer of the destitute and shall not despise their prayer. They delight in her dirt and take joy in her stones. Every time I go to Israel, this last time be no exception. There are more and more and more things that are uncovered. Uh, This last time I got to go into an area of Judea and Samaria, Bethel, Beit El, where Jacob had the vision of the ladder and seen it, and they, they keep uncovering more and more. And going to the area of the tower where Abraham is looking and he sees all the land that God had given him. And you start going through these things, and every time I go there, you go down to the Pool of Siloam. Uh, you, you realize the processional road is about ready to open up to the public. And you find out all these things are being uncovered. My daughter, she's 19. She doesn't like to go to Israel with us. You know why? We ask her, why don't you want to go to Israel with us? It's just a bunch of rocks. Well, it is a bunch of rocks. (laughs) But when you realize the stories that are told by the bunch of rocks, it's remarkable. I got to be on the Palm Sunday Road last week. And and I told everybody in the group, I said, and and you know where, you guys have been there, you know where the cemetery is, the Jewish cemetery, Mount of Olives? Well, we went into the cemetery with our guide, and he was talking about that and and the Messiah coming to why uh, Jews bury there outside the city, right on the hillside. But I told everybody, hey, you're about ready to walk the Palm Sunday Road. Make sure you pick up one of these rocks. And when you go home, people will say, what's with this rock? You tell them these are one of the rocks that did not cry out. When, when the group of people, they shouted out Hosanna, and the Pharisees said, hey, tell your people to stop saying Hosanna. Stop saying, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Remember what Jesus said? If I tell them to shut up, 
uh, then even these rocks will cry out. So I said, pick up one of those rocks, take it home, put it on your shelf. But I look every single time I go there and I see more and more that's discovered. And yet this isn't gonna be fulfilled until the millennial kingdom. I have people on our tour group that were asking me, they said, what do you think we'll be doing during the millennial kingdom? Well, there's a lot. But one of the things I think I'm gonna be doing, I'm gonna be going over to Israel, uncovering more and more and more of the history of the Lord Jesus Christ being right there in the land and the beginning of God working with man. And for all of eternity, we're gonna be filled with this knowledge ever increasing and, and we're gonna delight in the dust. And let me tell you, I'm not into digging in dirt. But when it comes to these things in the evidence, it is remarkable. And every time, it is just more and more. So Bible prophecy, what does it do? It shows that only God can be trusted. It proves the Bible is God's word. Number three, it expresses God's sovereignty. Um, Jan Markell was asked, she was complaining. She told me about this. She, she was, this guy was complaining about all the different things that are happening. I can't believe how bad this is. I can't believe how bad this is. And she simply said to him, well, what did you expect the last days to look like? <laughs> Everything is happening, just like the Bible said. I love how Pastor Jack just outlined everything. Everything points to the second coming of Christ, but the rapture is going to happen first. I get excited about that. You know, the, the illustration about Christmas and, and, and um Thanksgiving, thank you very much. You guys know that illustration, right? Okay, so I don't have to tell it. Okay, good. No, so for those of you who don't know it, it's, it's uh, when, when um, here in America, you're gonna celebrate um, Thanksgiving, but you can tell Thanksgiving is getting close, right? Because by October, you start to see all the Christmas decorations out. What do the Christmas decorations point to? They point to Christmas, but you know Thanksgiving's coming first. All of these signs, they point to the second coming of Christ, but we know the rapture's coming first. So we're able to say, man, when we see these things begin to take place, look up, lift up our heads, because our redemption draws near. Number four, it demonstrates God's love. Todd Hampson wrote, Bible prophecy demonstrates that God loves us and that he has a plan for our lives. We're not just floating around on a big spinning orb out in outer space with no purpose and no meaning, as atheists claim, God has crafted a purpose for every person he has ever made because he loves his children. God has also planned a destination for the faithful. He wants us to live with him in heaven and on the earth, new earth forever. And so he gives us prophecy to show how world history will end with the faithful living forever with our loving heavenly father in the eternal state. Number five, Bible prophecy reveals God's plan so we do not need to be afraid. We see stories like this. Christian Navy veteran charged with hate crime for beheading demon statue at Iowa Capitol. Some of you saw this, right? This was a couple of months ago. So in America, it's celebrated if you were to um, just destroy a Benjamin Franklin statue, George Washington, you, you would be celebrated, lifted up. But uh, to behead a demon statue, you're charged with a hate crime and looking at time in prison? We don't have to be afraid. I refuse to live in fear. Uh, it's like, there, there's no way. I will do everything I can until Jesus calls us home. But I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna live in fear. Uh, 365 times in the Bible, in one phrase, all, ology or another, the Bible tells us don't be afraid. Why 365 times? I think for every day of the year. In Proverbs chapter 29, you guys know the verse. The fear of man is a trap. It's a snare but it's the Lord who keeps us safe. And I'm telling you, as I mentioned in the last message, uh, fear is the product that these people are marketing. And you see something like that. We don't need to be afraid. And then you guys saw this. Was this here in Indiana that this happened? No? So six pro-life activists found guilty face 11 years in prison for peaceful protest. Okay, what were they found guilty of? 
You ready? This is so evil what they did. You guys sitting down? Because I'm going to show you. Watch out. This is what they did. So that was pretty awful, wasn't it? Let's arrest them and throw them all in jail. This is the world we live in. They want us to be afraid. We got the puppet masters that are pulling the strings. I refuse to be afraid. Don't be afraid. We are the ones who have the opportunity to be full of joy and full of hope. And all of these things give validity to the Bible, Jesus' first coming and his second coming, and we know the hope that we have in heaven. In Isaiah chapter 46, God says, remember the things I have done in the past, for I alone am God. I am God, and there is no other. Only I can tell you the future before it happens. Everything I plan will come to pass, for I do whatever I wish. He tells us the end from the beginning. So don't be afraid, all right? Number Six, it keeps us from being deceived. Uh, my friend Alex Newman was part of this sci- uh, climate meeting in, uh, down in the Saudi Arabia area last year. I think it was UAE uh, last year, not the recent one. Activists smashed tablets atop Mount Sinai to launch faith-based climate push. So the Ten Commandments, let's break those Ten Commandments. The climate, uh, the, you guys are the 10 climate commandments, right? And so my friend Alex Newman is a journalist. He interviewed these people, but they're they're nuts. But they're lifting up climate. They will worship the creation, Romans chapter one, right? Rather than the creator. And that is being lifted up. And if you don't go along with it, you're very bad. In fact, be afraid, be very afraid because you are destroying the earth and your grandchildren are gonna die because of you. And not only that, Indiana is going to be covered with oceans because the, everything's going to melt and we're all going to be underwater. Vatican newspaper urges Catholics to fast from fossil fuels for Lent. There you go. <laughs> that was actually last year, but they want us to be afraid, right? Number seven, Bible prophecy proves that God is the only one who is worthy. Revelation, let me turn over here. Revelation chapter five. Fortunately, somebody traded out that tiny Bible with one with large print. This is very large print. Revelation chapter five. I love this. It's in the passage where you have all of the different creatures that are around the throne of God. And I believe we also are there. And they're looking, going, who is worthy to loose the seals that are on the scroll? You know that passage? Revelation chapter 5 tells us here, they sang a new song with these words. You are worthy when they discover Jesus is the worthy one. You are worthy to take the scroll and break its seals and open it. This is the seven seals on the scroll that begin the the tribulation period with the four horsemen of the apocalypse, the first four seals. You, Jesus, the lamb, are worthy to take the scroll and break its seals and open it. For you were slaughtered and your blood has ransomed people to God from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have caused them to become kings and priests for our God and they will reign on 
earth, for we are the redeemed. Then I looked again and I heard the voices of thousands and millions of angels around the throne of the, four, of the living creatures and the elders, and they sang in a mighty chorus, worthy as the lamb who was slaughtered to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea. And they sang blessing and honor and glory and power belong to the one sitting on the throne and to the lamb forever and ever and ever. And the four living creatures said amen. And the 24 elders fell down and worshiped the lamb. I love that. You alone are worthy to be worshiped forever and ever and ever. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm gonna lose my voice. Number eight, Bible prophecy reminds us that God will crush all evil. Ecclesiastes chapter 11 <coughs> says, Excuse me, just a second. Pastor Joe told me you were prayer warriors here. I'm not so sure. <laughs> Ecclesiastes chapter eight, verse 11 tells us this, because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. You know who knows this? The people who, who make laws in our country. They know that. I believe they are intentionally creating lawlessness. Why is that? They know you can't let the rapist out of jail because they're going to rape again. The murderer out of jail because they're going to murder her again. The thief out of jail because they're, they're, they're thieves. Unless the Lord Jesus Christ changes them. They know exactly what they are doing. What happens? The victim becomes the suspect and the suspect becomes the victim in our society. And so they don't execute judgment and therefore, we see a massive increase in lawlessness. Case in point, New York City. What's happening? Lawlessness is abounding in the subways. So what do you do? Call in the National Guard. Did you guys see that this last week? I believe it's a plan to bring about a state police. You create the lawlessness. They know this. And then you say, wait, <clears throat> we have the solution. It reminds us that God will crush all evil. Um, Jesus is coming again. In Revelation chapter 19, people get bothered about this, but just before you see the marriage supper of the Lamb, what takes place is you have, in fact, I'm gonna, can I, can I turn it over there and read? I'm just asking, just, you know, <laughs> I'm going, Revelation chapter 19 says this. After this, verse one, I heard what sounded like a vast crowd in heaven shouting, praise the Lord, salvation and honor and glory and power belong to our God. His judgments are pure and just and true. He has punished <clears throat> the great prostitute who corrupted the earth with her immorality. He has avenged the murder of his servants. And again, their voices rang out, praise the Lord. The smoke from that city ascends forever and ever. Then the 24 elders and the four living beings fell down and worshiped God who was sitting on the throne. And they cried out, amen, praise the Lord. And from the throne came a voice that said, praise our God, all his servants, all who fear him from the least to the greatest. And then I heard again what sounded like the shout of a vast crowd or the roar of mighty oceans, uh, uh, ocean waves or the crash of loud thunder. I believe this is us in heaven, praising the Lord for what he's doing. Praise the Lord for the Lord our God, the Lord Almighty reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and let us give honor to him for the time has come for the wedding feast of the lamb and his bride has prepared herself. She has been given the finest of pure white linen to wear for the fine linen represents the good deeds of God's people. What are they doing? They're praising God 
because you are going to judge the wickedness that has come upon the earth. It reminds me that God is going to crush all evil. Daniel chapter 9. Uh, it says 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city. What for? To put in an end of transgression, an end of sin, bring in righteousness, seal up vision and prophecy, and anoint the most holy. Bring an end to all the sin, an end to all the wickedness. So when I see what is happening in the schools to the children, when I recognize what our government is doing, when I see what's going on in the cities and the lawlessness and the absolute wickedness that is taking place, I watch what's going on on our borders and I know it's intended to destroy this nation and bring in this evil system. I say, praise the Lord, because those 70 weeks will be fulfilled. It is settled. Where God says, it is determined. It really means it is settled. Daniel, nobody can change it. Seven years are determined for the world to go through this <laughs> because I will bring an end to sin, I will bring in righteousness, and Jesus will come back. So it reminds us that God will. I'm almost done, but I don't think I'm going to make it. <laughs> it makes us want to be right with the Lord. I have to talk quieter. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night <coughs> in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness looking for the coming of the day of God? I look, I look at that and I think... Oh. <coughs> is when you have a coughing fit in front of a whole bunch of people. <laughs> but this is what it ought to do. Rightly understood, what manner of person ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness. It makes us want to be right with the Lord. <coughs> and <coughs> i got to finish. <coughs> I, I... It, it gives us hope. Keep this in mind. Vertical focus keeps us from horizontal panic. You look up, you don't go into panic with what's around you. One last thought. I mentioned earlier, we, we see the finish line, right? What happens when a runner runs the race? If the Olympics are coming this summer, they're going around the track, 1,000-meter race, whatever, however long it is. They're all trotting about the same pace. I could keep pace with some of them during some of the race, not very long. But they're all going about the same pace, right? When they make the last turn and they know the finish line is there, what do they all do? <clears throat> A runner told me recently it's a kick. Every one of them, the one who's going for first place and the one who knows he doesn't have a chance to win, every one of them is running harder than they ever were before. Off. I'm just going to wrap it up. Finish the race, run as hard as you possibly can. The time is short, all right? Lord, we thank you for your word in Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>
Well, listen, let's pray for uh, Tom, and uh, let's pray for Jack, let's pray for Tommy, and let's pray for Dr. Lutzer also. We're, we're blessed to have these gifted individuals in the body of Christ, aren't we? So, Lord, we thank you so much for your loving kindness, and thank you for putting together this conference with this wonderful combination of speakers. And Lord, we lift up Tom Hughes, pray for his uh, throat and his voice, uh, pray that you just send forth your word and heal him and strengthen him in Jesus' name. Uh, give both Jackie and, and Tom extra strength and stamina from all, the, all their travels and all they're doing. Uh, just touch them in Jesus' name. And Jack Hibbs, Lord, surround him with your loving kindness. We pray for your hedge of protection about he and Lisa and their two daughters, uh, their church, uh, which is under attack. But Father, we thank you that greater are you who's in Jack and his family and the Christians in his church than he that's in the world. So we claim your victory for, for Jack, uh, even greater fruit coming from his ministry. And Lord, we thank you for Dr. Lutzer. What a gifted individual he is. Uh, thank you for letting him be with us this morning. Bless he and his, his wife, in Jesus' name, and their, their, their children. Uh, Dr. Ice, we just so blessed to have Tommy and Janice with us. So thank you for all you're doing in them and through them and the, just the gifted mind that you've given to him and the wealth of information he, he gives to us. So strengthen all these guys and the speakers and their families. Uh, we love you. We bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Just, just before we have a break for a few minutes, well, four or five or ten, uh, I want to remind you tonight is going to be very special because we have the Q&A. Right before the Q&A at 7 o'clock, we're going to have just a brief time of worship. And we have such a, a gifted worship leader. You, you just don't want to miss her. She's such, such a joy, so anointed, uh, you can't help but worship. Even if you're not a worshiper, which you should be, you'll be worshiping tonight. So Vivi is fantastic. And uh, then... I know some of you have to go, and it's not our purpose to take you away from your home churches, but if you're around the area tomorrow, uh, Tom and, and uh, Tommy Ice are sharing with us tomorrow at 1030. So God bless you. Have a nice break.
Okay. Bless you. We're ready to get started for our last session of the afternoon. The day's going by fast, isn't it? Don't forget to pick up a Q&A card and uh, give us your questions. Take advantage of these men while they're here, and we'll seek to answer these questions tonight. Yeah, he's going to get you right there. And so we're blessed to have Dr. Ice with us again, and... uh, This is a part of the subject, but I'm just going to ask him to, to, to mention about the Pre-Trib Research Center because every, every December they have a wonderful conference. Uh, I've gleaned great insights from the conference and also picked up some speakers from, from the conference. So, uh, tell me if you just share a little bit about that conference and about the Pre-Trib Research Center. They have, their board is made up of tremendous guys. Just great Bible scholars and teachers. So thank you, Tommy. Is this on? Okay, yeah, there it is. Yeah, the pre trib uh, study group was Tim LaHaye's idea. And, uh, I started working for him uh, about 35 years ago, and then he went and died on us. You know, and he just completed, you know, he was 92, I think, 93. He, he just completed his next 10-year plan, you know. Uh, he was that way. And he was an amazing guy. And uh, a lot of people don't realize he started the Institute for Creation Research and hired Henry Morris. He was the first guy to have a Christian school system down in San Diego. He started the Sunday School Association when he was a pastor in Minnesota. Uh, just other stuff like that, which is why Wheaton College named him the most influential Christian in the second half of the 20th century over Billy Graham, Jerry Falwell, a lot of those kinds of people. Uh, A few months before he died, he got that award. But nevertheless, uh, and so I went to work for him and have... The, I'm the only person that's been to all 32 pre-trib study groups in uh, 32 years. And uh, so we have a conference, and you can go to our website. There's the web address right there, www.pre-trib.org. And uh, we have 2,000 articles talking about things relating to prophecy and defending and all that kind of stuff. And we have, I think, 18 years of video presentations. Each presentation is an hour and a half of famous people, usually, that uh, present uh, things related to the rapture and Bible prophecy. One year we had uh, focused totally on Israel, and six of our ten presenters were Jewish believers, for example and things like that. And so I, I'm, you know, and we're in December every year, early in December, and you can go to our webpage if you're interested in coming. Anybody can come. Uh, we, we had a guy last year who was an anti-pre-trib guy, and he came and tried to take over our conference, but he, he didn't. We rebuked him in the name of Jesus. No, we, we, he, 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 he just kept uh, asking a bunch of questions or, things like that, like he was some uh, guy who was trying to play I gotcha or something like that. But So I'm going to be talking about anti-Semitism, the longest hatred. You know, it goes all the way back to Egypt, remember? And uh, so anti-Semitism is the hatred or persecution of the Jews. Uh It's the hatred and persecution of Jews as a group, not the hatred of persons who happen to be Jewish. In other words, because maybe an individual may be a jerk or something like that, and they happen not to like them. That's not necessarily anti-Semitism. But rather the hatred of a person because they are Jewish. 
And there's a lot of people all over the world, especially in Muslim countries, that have never met a Jew in their life. And they're anti, very anti-Semitic. And uh, Jeremiah 30, verse 15 says, Because they have called you an outcast, saying, It is Zion, no one cares for her. And in that context, he's talking about these kinds of things there in Jeremiah. Uh, here is a lady who spoke at the City College of City University of New York. And uh, may every Zionist burn in the hottest pit of hell. I, you know, this, she gave the speech, the student speech at graduation, and talked about this. Meet uh, City University of New York Law School's anti-Semitic graduation speaker. So there she is, uh, and they have they had a big protest and all that. And she goes to the place where the Jews had a lot of captives and making trouble there as well. You know, they have the pictures of many of the Jewish people that were captured back in October. And here's a nice little uh, graphic that pictures Jews worshiping at the Wailing Wall, which they hate, the fact that they exist. And here's a statement. Gradually, I began to hate them. For me, this was the time of the greatest spiritual upheaval I have ever gone through. I have ceased to be a weak-kneed cosmopolitan and have become an anti-Semite. That was by Adolf Hitler. Uh, now, Satan hates Israel. Did you know that? And because... And he's trying to disrupt God's plan at any point. So that's why he is behind anti-Semitism, of course. And the Antichrist is anti-Semitic. And he's anti-Israel. See, before Israel became a nation, it was just Jew hatred. Now that they become a nation again, it's, it's both. Hating Jews as individuals and as a people group and hating the nation now. Anti-Zionism, it's called. So anti-Semitism is caused by Satan himself, according to Revelation 12, a whole chapter in the Bible that talks about that in the book of Revelation. Now, so there's over 550 allusions to the Old Testament in the book of Revelation. When we say allusions, it got, has phrases and references, but it never directly quotes the Old Testament, an entire book. What we mean by quote is where someone would say, like in 1 Corinthians, just as the scripture says, and then it quotes. But it's the most saturated Old Testament book, a New Testament book with the Old Testament, with all these phrases and things like that in it. So it's kind of the grand central station of the Bible where everything is brought together uh, and put in an organized way about the future. And uh, by the way, every prophet in the Old Testament, uh, except Jonah, has prophecy about the future, not including the Psalms. The book of Deuteronomy, something like uh, a third of it is future prophecy. People tend not to think of things like that, but nevertheless it is. And so when we look at the first verse, Revelation 12, 1, it says, And a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and on her head, a crown of 12 stars. And uh, by the way, the European Union took that 12 star thing, and that's in their flag for the European Union. And I've searched their website over and over again, and they don't say why they picked that, just that they did. And they say that they got it from the book of Revelation here, you see. So here is that. First verse here, so, and it says, And she was with child, and she cried out, being in labor and in pain to give birth. And so, 39 symbols are used in the book of Revelation. 19 are explained in Revelation text itself. For example, here is where they explain a symbol that's used. <laughs> Uh, as for the mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are 
the angels of the seven churches. So you, say, you don't have to drop a tab of LSD and hallucinate to try to figure this thing out. And it says the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So it tells you half of the time what they are. The other half are explained somewhere else in Scripture, especially in the Old, almost all in the Old Testament. And this is what we see about the woman in Genesis 12, 1 and 2. And we go to Genesis 37, 5 through 6. And it says, Then Joseph had a dream. And when he told it to his brothers, they all said, Boy, that's great, Joe. No, they hated him even more. And he said to them, Please listen to this dream which I have had. For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheaves rose up and also stood erect. And behold, your sheaves gathered round and bowed down to my sheaves. Then his brother said to him, Are you actually going to reign over us? They Look, a lot of Bible scholars can't figure this thing out, but his brothers did. Are, are you really going to rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Now he had still another dream. So you have all of these dreams in the early Genesis are in pairs. It happened twice. <clears throat> and he related it to his brothers and said, Lo, I've had still another dream, and behold, the sun and the moon and 11 stars were bowing down to me. So here you have the combination of the sun, moon, and stars. And he related it to his father and to his brothers, and his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have had? Shall I and your mother and your brothers actually come to bow ourselves down before you to the ground? Well, as they said in Angels of the Outfield, it could happen. And his brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the saying in mind. Uh, the woman refers to Israel even though it recapitulates items relating to Mary. The, the Catholic Church says it refers to Mary in this passage. Well, it is Mary, but how it's used symbolically refers to the nation of Israel in the context here. So it's the, in the context of the overall narrative, it signifies the travail of Israel at the time of the first coming of Christ as borne out in verses 3 and 4. In other words, this explains it later in verse 3. And another sign appeared in the heaven, and behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns, and on his head were seven diadems. And, of course, this is uh, a satanic attacks, which we'll talk about here later in a moment. And the seven heads refer to seven kings that have happened historically. Now, there's a lot of different views than the one I'm taking here, but I think, of course, this is the right one. And uh, the, this, these refer to the, those that have persecuted Israel historically. And so Egypt, which is represented by the Pharaoh, is one. Two, Assyria and Sennacherib persecuting Israel. Then you have Babylon, Nebi, I call him, Nebuchadnezzar in the book of Daniel. You have the Medo-Persians, Azarias, who persecuted them. You have Greece, Antiochus Epiphanes. And you have Rome, Caesar. And so those are six of the seven heads. And then the seventh is the future revived Roman Antichrist which is the future. And so this is a prophetic uh, representation of the historical, per, main historical persecutions of the woman, which represents Israel. And the ten horns, it talks about, ten kings that rule together with the Antichrist. And so <clears throat> Revelation 17 12 says, and the ten horns which you saw are ten kings who have not yet received a kingdom, but they receive authority as kings with the beast for one hour. 
This is why I believe the rapture happens and there has to be an interval of time before the tribulation starts. How does the tribulation start? With the signing of the covenant between Israel and the revived Roman Antichrist. Well, there's got to be a process for those ten kings to arise and then out of the ten king thing, uh, ten nation thing, the Antichrist arises. So the ten nation confederacy has to formulate and then the Antichrist has to come from that ten nation confederacy. You see what I'm saying? So obviously you're not going to have the rapture in the next day the seven year tribulation starts. So there's got to be an interval of time uh, between the rapture and the start of the tribulation for th this and some other events to, be to begin to take place. And the seven diadems refers to the seven kings mentioned earlier. So ten horns and seven kings. And so it's talking about the legacy of these items here. And in 12.4a it says, And his tail swept away a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And of course this is the only place where we learn that one third of the angels fell when they fell. Uh, the stars are going to be later stated to be angels going to have the same language repeated but uses the word angels. And so this is where we find that one-third of the stars of heaven fell with Lucifer, Satan, who was the, bright, uh, you know, the, the most beautiful guy who was right in the presence of God, uh, and his pride led to his fall. And they swept away a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. Now this is the midpoint of the tribulation. Satan is drop-kicked out of heaven. And you say, well, does he have access to heaven? Yes, he does. We see this in the book of Job, don't we, in the first two chapters, uh, that he, has ac he doesn't live in heaven necessarily, but he has access when he brings the angelic counsel together. I could get off on Job how that's a prolegomena to the whole of Scripture, uh, how uh, the issue, and it's the oldest book in the Bible, how it show, deals with the problem of evil and stuff like that. So, in the second half of verse 4 says, And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she gave birth, he might devour her child. And of course, once again, that's referring to uh, just trying to destroy Jesus Christ uh, in history and stuff. And so, uh, the, these satanic entities have attacked the Lord. So these are historical instances. Here's some historical instances of Satan's hostility toward the woman's seed. You see Cain's murder of Abel in Genesis 4, 8. Because uh, Abel brought the, the proper sacrifice and Cain didn't. See, right off the bat, they didn't live in a ghetto and ha or have bad environment. Right off the bat, one of the, in history, one of the brothers kills another. First murder. So then you have the corrupting of human seed through angelic and human marriage. I take that literally, that the Nephilim were, uh, I guess, these somewhat half-breeds and Apparently, there are probably a few billion people before the flood because of the age that they could live and the uh, fact that the earth uh, and things was much more productive before the flood and all of these kinds of things, and yet it came down to eight people that were on the ark. <coughs> you had the attempted rape of Sarah in Genesis 12, and Rebecca in Genesis 26 to corrupt the seed here, you see. Rebecca's plan to cheat Esau out of his birthright and the consequent enmity between Esau against Jacob in Genesis 27. You have murder of the male children in Egypt in Exodus chapter 1 to try to destroy this. You have the attempted murders of David. Uh, dozens of times Saul tried to kill him in 1 Samuel 
You have Queen Athaliah's attempt to destroy the royal seed in 2 Chronicles 22. And there, there you have a, a person, a boy, who is the lone seed through which the Messiah would eventually come. And uh, Queen Athaliah tried to kill him, but he was hid away and you know, taken care of, so to speak, and didn't succeed. You have Haman's attempt to slaughter the Jews in the book of Esther. A whole book there about how uh, they were saved. And the consequent attempts of the Israelites to murder their own children for so false sacrificial purposes throughout various parts of the Old Testament. Herod's attack against the children of Bethlehem in Matthew 2, very well-known, famous situation there, obviously, which is why they fled into Egypt. Many incidences during Jesus' earthly life, including his temptation, that typify the ongoing attempt of the dragon to devour the woman's child once born. And so this is the struggle between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent that we see start, uh, going way back. And in verse 5 it says, And she gave birth to a son, a male child, who is to rule which means to shepherd all the nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up to God and his throne. That's the word for rapture, by the way, harpazo here. And uh, so it looks back at the ascension of Christ in Acts chapter 1, where he ascends as a rapture. The rapture is how you get from earth to heaven physically. And so I, it's not part of this talk, but, you know, there are like at least eight or nine raptures throughout the Bible in history. But that's a whole other talk. And so here uh, it, it shows the, the ascension in this framework here of the uh, child. And by the way, rod of iron there is out of uh, Psalm 2 ruling the earth with a rod of iron, and he's caught up to the throne of God. And we see in Psalm 2, it says, Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt shatter them like earthenware. In other words, it talks about Christ ruling the nations there. And he is not going to be elected. He's going to be a dictator. And he's going to reign and rule with righteousness at that time. Acts 1, 9 through 10. And after he said had said these things, he was lifted up while they were looking on, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And as they were gazing intently into the sky, while he was departing, behold, two men in white clothing stood beside them. These are, of course, angelic beings who explained it. Why do you seek the living? You know, why, why do you seek him? Now, this is the second coming when he comes back, not the rapture. But he's going to come back. That it's referring to is referring to the second coming. And they said, "Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky?" Well, wouldn't you? I mean, you know. And when he gets out of sight, I guess you keep looking. Is he still there? No. Okay. This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in just the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. The second coming, where he comes physically down, puts his foot on the Mount of Olives on planet Earth. And then we see in verse 6, it says, The woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared by God so that she might be nourished for 1,260 days. And so this, this is talking about the second half of the tribulation where who's the woman? Israel where she is, leaves uh, Jerusalem and Judea area, that part of Israel. Now, we know, for example, the 144,000 will be all over the world preaching the gospel, and obviously every Jew is not going to be there at that time. But, uh, uh, you know, we're almost at the point today where, where just about 50% of world Jews now live in Israel. And... Uh, when the nation was founded, it was only like 800,000. So uh, there's been all of these persecutions. And by the way, 
it's not surprising since October, is it 7th? They've had a rush of people coming, wanting to, especially from Europe, wanting to move to Israel. A lot of American Jews as well. Uh, and they've already had a, a bunch of, I think, uh, th tens of thousands have already moved to Israel because of that. So that's part of the purpose of these things going on is to get Jews back to the land of Israel. So uh, she is going to go to the Petra area. Anybody been to Petra? I, yeah, a number of y'all, I've been there. <clears throat> and it says when you see that flee, that's the midpoint of the tribulation. Flee, get out of, get out of Dodge, as we would say. Uh, and we see in Matthew 24, 15 through 18, it says, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken of through Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. In other words, go back and study the book of Daniel. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let him who is on the housetop not go back to get his things out of uh, out that are in the ha his house, and let him who is in the field and not turn back to get his cloak. In other words, don't go get your cell phone if it's off over there, you know, or anything like that. Uh, get out, because why? God's going to take care of you supernaturally. And you, the best thing is you want to get out and get away from the persecution. But woe to those who are with child and to those who nurse babes in those days. You know, I'm told... <laughs> a little more difficult to transport yourself when you're carrying a, another person. It says, but pray that your flight might not be in the winter. See, they have a lot of uh, rain that goes in the wadis and everything. It's harder to travel. Or on a Sabbath. Why? Because Orthodox Jews are, you know, are supposedly only able to travel a few, is it 100 or 1,000 feet or something like that. Uh, for then there will be a great tribulation. Now, earlier in the first part of Matthew 24, it talks about tribulation. Here it says the great tribulation. So that's the second half of the 70th week of Daniel. Such has not occurred since the beginning of the world until now or ever shall. And unless those days have been cut short, uh, some people try to say, well, that means the tribulation's cut short from seven years. No, it's talking about the process of persecution if God didn't interrupt it, that doesn't mean it's going to cut the tribulation short. You see, it's talking about if that process were allowed to go on, it says uh, no life would have been saved. It's talking about Jews here, Jewish life. But for the sake of the elect, and this is the third time this term is used in Matthew 24, the two previous times it refers to Jewish believers. So here, the third time, consistently, it refers to Jewish believers. So for the sake of the elect, those days shall be cut short. In other words, two, seven years. And then we see in Isaiah 41, 17 through 18, it says, The afflicted and the needy are seeking water, but there is none, and their tongue is parts with thirst. I, the Lord, will answer them myself. As God of Israel, I will not forsake them. I will open rivers on the bare heights and springs in the midst of the valleys, and I will make the wilderness a pool of water and the dry land fountains of water. Seems like that happened during the Exodus, didn't it? Uh, Isaiah 41, 19 through 20, I will put the cedar in the wilderness, the Achaia, in other words, productivity from the water will occur, and the myrtle and the olive tree. And I will place the juniper in the desert together with the box tree and the cypress that they may see and recognize and consider and gain insight as well that the hand of the Lord has done this and the Holy One of Israel has created it. So this can be part of the process that God uses to convert uh, the Jewish people by the end of the tribulation. And so this is Petra. And... Uh, it says, I will surely assemble all of you, Jacob. I will surely gather the remnant of Israel, and I will put them together like sheep in the fold. And that's the Hebrew word, Basra. And there is a town right by what is called Petra today called Basra. Now, there's another Basra over uh, 
elsewhere in the Middle East. I think it's, is it Syria or something like that? But the, this little town named Basra is right at the entrance of uh, what we call Petra. Like a flock in the midst of its pasture, they will be noisy with men. And uh, so there you have it, Petra, and here's Israel, and uh, I've been there. I think I already said that, but that's where it's located. Big tourist place now. (laughs) And it's about one and a quarter mile through that passageway through the mountains, and at one point, I think it's uh, seven feet wide, and, and that's why it was such, in the ancient times, a great fortress because you'd hold them off because the mountains were surrounded it. And by the way, it's, it would go uh, as far as 14 miles in, inside in this open area and all of that, but it was surrounded by these terrible mountains. You couldn't have a large military force invading you from another place. They would have to come in through this other area, and you could hold them off uh, in that way. Why it's called sheepfold. So here, here's a picture of that entry, that one and a quarter mile entryway at uh, places. As you go into it, there, there I, Janice are, and after you get into the area where it opens up, and there we are in camels. This, they, you know, they they want to sell you something everywhere you go. You know what I mean. And uh, But you see in verse 7 it says, <clears throat> And there was war in heaven, Michael and his angels waging war with the dragon. And the dragon and his angels waged war. So this is the midpoint of the tribulation once again. And fi- finally, we're going to see that Satan is, and his angels fight this angelic war and it, verses 7 through 12 explain verse 6, which is why Israel will flee into the wilderness. And the, uh, verse 8 says, and they were not strong enough, and there was no longer found a place for them in heaven. So Satan no longer has access to heaven, uh, you know, like to bring charges against people like Job, as we see, and other times in the Old Testament as well. And so they're, they're kicked out of there, and their whole focus now is on Israel and, and these people. And so that's explaining why the great tribulation in the second half is so bad. And verse 9 says, And the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old, who is called the devil and Satan. So here it tells you who he is. The serpent of old... So where do we see him first? Genesis 3, right? Who is called the devil and Satan, two of his terms, Satan, uh, who deceives the whole world. Now here, whole world is used, you know, to refer to especially the world of unbelievers. So everybody in the world uh, who basically as an unbeliever, he was thrown down to the earth and his angels were thrown down with him. So that would be one-third, however many that is. I'm sure it's millions and millions. The angels were thrown down with him. So they're concentrating now there. <coughs> and then verse 10, first part of verse 10, says, I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now... The salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and authority of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brethren has been thrown down. See, so that's what he does. Satan brings lawsuits against believers. He accuses believers. Did you see so-and-so? Do you know what he did? You know, or she? Uh, you know, all, all of those kinds of things. So it shows you what Satan's job was doing before, but now he loses access to be able to bring these lawsuits, so to speak, or these charges against believers out of heaven. Who accuses them before our God day and night. So he, he never rests. He's very active. 
and uh, we may sleep, but he doesn't. And so he, he loses his ability to bring these, the case against believers at this point in history. And it says, talking about the believers in verse 11, and they overcame him because of the blood of the Lamb and because of the word of their testimony, and they did not love their life even to death. In other words, this is the gospel. Because of the blood of the Lamb, this refers to Christ's substitutionary atonement, does it not? Yes. Which is the basis of the gospel and the word of their testimony. In other words, that means these people have accepted Christ as their Savior. And so it's the atoning work of Christ which is the basis of our salvation, and a person's acceptance of that, who can say, I, yes, I trusted Jesus Christ as a, the sole basis of my salvation, not any works that I've done, but through simple faith and trust alone. And then it talks about the third item here is they did not love their life even to death. And, that, and as a result, like you can read about in Fox's Book of Martyr, you know, they're willing to die for Christ. They're not going to, during the tribulation, they're not going to take the mark. They're not going to deny Jesus Christ uh, during this terrible time of period. They'd rather die. And so this is a tremendous explanation of what's going to happen during that part of the tribulation. And it says, for this reason, rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Now, The term earth dwellers is used in Revelation 3.10, and it's a term from Isaiah, uh, and it is one of the reasons why you have the tribulation, to test those who dwell upon the earth. And then that phrase is used 10 more times throughout the book of Revelation. And, in con- and not a single earth dweller ever becomes a believer. And it says, because their names were not found written in the book of life from the foundation of the earth. The last two uses of it gives that explanation. So here is one of the two uses of the phrase heaven dweller. Uh, For this reason rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. So this is the contrast to the earth dweller. You know, these are some of the themes in the book of Revelation, earth dwellers versus the heaven dwellers. And they're rejoicing in heaven, and these presumably are church-age martyrs that are in heaven at this time. But woe to the earth and the sea because the devil has come down to you. In other words, he's focused only there, having great wrath, knowing that he has only a short time. In other words, only three and a half years. here. And, uh, you know, it's kind of like a a criminal, uh, and the police are chasing him, and he goes to a house or something and barricades himself in, you know, and the police surround him like a 100 police cars or something, and the guy gets on the microphone and says, come out, you're surrounded, you know, we got you. And does the bad guy come out and say, okay, you guys win? No. They want to go down. You usually have to blow up the house or something like that to, to get them. So Satan's not, that motivates him, you see, because knowing he has a short time, it doesn't make him want to give up. And so he doubles down as if he's not active enough now. And it says in verse 13, And when the dragon saw that he was thrown down to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. Who's the woman? Israel. And so he focuses more in on his persecution of Israel. And I think we're beginning to, you know, look, look at what's happened just in the last, you know, since October 6th, 7th. Uh, the whole world's turning against Israel. Uh, the polls show that 85% of Americans are still pro-Israel. But who's getting all the press and recognition? 
And I've noticed in these pictures, half of the people in the crowds coming after are Muslim, you know, or look like they're Muslim. You know, they, many of them are Muslims, and many of them are not, about half, 50-50. And so they're stirring up, uh, you know, the crowds in the United States, and they become very active. You'd think somebody's in control of these things, you know? And so he, he doesn't give up. He tries to because he believes if he can obstruct God's plan at any point, then he would have won. But, of course, our Lord's always two or three steps ahead of him. You know, he thought when he killed Jesus, uh, it says in Corinthians, I say, had he known that, he would have never crucified the Lord of glory. Had he known what was going to happen at, at, as a result of that. So Satan obviously was behind crucifying Christ, right? But the Lord used that as the basis for our salvation, and he rose him from the dead. Had he known, he would have never, but, well. <clears throat> and then it says, and two wings of the great eagle were given to the woman. in order that she might fly into the wilderness to her place. So this has to be the Israeli Air Force, right? <laughs> the American Air? Nah, not the American Air Force. This is language about God rescuing Israel, where she was nourished for a time, time, and half a time from the presence of serpents. So this is Israel in Petra, being taken care of supernaturally because, you know, you could fly a helicopter into Petra nowadays, you see, but God's going to protect them. I don't know how, but he is. And we see the same language in Exodus. For example, 19.4, it says, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. See, it's, it's language from the Old Testament. All, most of this stuff is out of the language out of the Old Testament that's brought together here. Uh, so that means he, he's rescuing. And it, what would happen is an angel when they're, I'm sorry, an eagle, when they were getting ready to let their young out of their nest, is they would take them and take them out and flop them out and see if they could fly. If they couldn't, the, the eagle would swoop down and catch the young one you know, and bring them back to the nest. And they would try that until they were able to fly, so to speak. And so this is the idea of bearing them up on eagles' wings. And we see in Deuteronomy 32, 10 through 11, he found him in a desert land and in the howling waste of a wilderness. He encircled him. He cared for him. He guarded him as the pupil of his eye. Uh, and that's the most sensitive part of the body you don't you know, touch your pupil. Like an eagle that stirs up its nest, that hovers over its young, he spread his wings and caught them, and he carried them on his pinions. And so there's a further description of what I just described about that and how the Lord's going to take care of Israel in a similar way. And then we see in verse 15, and the serpent poured water out like a river out of his mouth after the woman so that he might cause her to be swept away with the flood. So, Satan, the Antichrist, sends his troops there militarily to come after him, but God protects them anyway. And so it shows you he, there's a tremendous amount of effort that the Antichrist does to try to go after the woman who is there in Petra. And, uh, but the Lord's going to take care of her. So it's talking about a very large military operation of some kind to go after the Jews there. And the, verse 16 says, And the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and drank up the river which the dragon poured out of his mouth. And so the Lord's going to somehow take care of it. And I'm not sure exactly what all this means exactly, but it's something along that line in verse 16. And then we see the last verse of the chapter. It says, And the dragon was enraged with the woman and went off to make war with the rest of her offspring. So who's that? 
well, these are probably the Gentile believers uh, who become believers during the, tri the tribulation, who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. So these are people who are genuine believers, probably Gentiles primarily, because he's talking about attacking the Jews here. And those are people who uh, are saved, but also living the Christian life. They keep the commandments of the Lord. And so here you have this whole chapter about Israel in the tribulation. And yet there's people today that say Israel is not even mentioned. You know, the replacement theology people that we've mentioned during this conference. And then <coughs> you have this all ending up with the campaign of Armageddon, and that occurs in eight stages. You have the gathering of the armies of the Antichrist, and you see them in the valley of Armageddon. Uh, and so this is where Napoleon in 1799 said all the armies of the world could come here and, uh, you know, do battle. And so Armageddon, uh, some say Armageddon because the H on the front would mean Har, meaning a mountain. And Megiddo, the valley, Har is the valley of Megiddo. And uh, this is where the armies of the world are going to come and bivouac before they attack Jerusalem. So there's no battle that takes place there. It's simply the armies positioning themselves from all the world in order to get ready to attack Jerusalem. So you have the gathering of the armies of the Antichrist, and then secondly, God has a preemptive strike where he destroys Babylon. Why? And you have two chapters, set around 17 and 18. That's the capital of the Antichrist, at least by the midpoint of the tribulation. He moves thing to Babylon. Uh, Babylon is mentioned about 350 times in the Bible. Jerusalem is mentioned about 850 times. And so what you end up with throughout Scripture is a battle between Jerusalem versus Babylon. Now, there are a lot of passages that talk about Jerusalem being a harlot and all of that, but yes, she's going to become faithful at the end. But nevertheless, Babylon is destroyed uh, by the Lord, which chapter 17 and 18 talk about in Revelation. And then you have the fall of Jerusalem, where they attack Jerusalem, and uh, it says in Zechariah, half of the city falls. So this can't be 80, 70, as some people, the preterists try to say, and all of that, because the entire city was destroyed in AD 70. And it says the armies of the Antichrist then go down to Basra, and so this is Petra where they're at. And so they do a flank movement down there to go after the Jews who are in Petra at this point, or Basra. And by this time, you have Israel's regeneration, where the, the Jews are converted to Christ. We see this in Romans 11, where it says all Israel will be saved. And I think this is what, the trib what you have, and it says in Zechariah 13, 8 or 9, around in there, that... Uh, one-third of the Jews will be saved. So I would argue that he's using the tribulation to purge out the non-elect Jewish people so that by the time you get to the end of the tribulation, every Jewish person alive will become a believer in Messiah. Why? Because at the end of Matthew 23, the, per the, the Messiah cannot come to Israel. Jesus said, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That's the condition for the second coming, is they have to say, call on the Lord, and this is what's going to happen at this point in history. And see, a lot of people, if you don't read the Bible thoroughly, you just say, well, Jesus is coming back, you know. There's all these details, you see what I'm saying, that are in Scripture. Because when you look at real history, there's a lot of details involved, you see? And this is real history. And then you have the second coming where he, he uh, comes to rescue 
the uh, Jews there in Petra. And then you have the end of the fighting in the Valley of Jehoshaphat. Now, it was said that George Whitfield, who they said could be heard a mile away, he had such a great voice, could say Jehoshaphat and make women weep. Well, I don't see any weeping women, so we'll <laughs> move on here. <laughs> and that's that valley that runs up and down the Jordan River where it says the blood will run uh, up to the horse's bridle. That's about 200 miles. And then you have the victory ascent upon the Mount of Olives here. That's where Jesus left from the Mount of Olives, right? And he's going to come back. Now, if you've been to Jerusalem, there's one little copula there that has a footprint supposedly that Jesus left when he went off. I don't buy that myself, but nevertheless, the Catholics, you know, they made a thing out of that. But he's going to come back and put his foot down and split the mountain of, out of olives as they begin to prepare for uh, the millennial kingdom. And here's the second coming. And the armies in Revelation 19, it says, And the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. Who's that? Us. Good. Y'all are really on top of this. Most people don't know. Yeah, so if you've ever wanted to ride a horse, this will be your chance. <laughs> and we all know the good guys wear white, right? That's why my cowboy hat is white. <clears throat> and from his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may smite the nations. Now, I think that that is simply a way of saying he's going to speak a word of judgment. And he will rule them with a rod of iron, Psalm 2 again. And he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty, you know, the blood running down as he comes down. And by the way, every unbeliever in conjunction with the second coming will be killed. And that's why uh, and those in their mortal bodies who are Surviving will be believers, and they'll go into the millennium. And on his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. In the Greek text, that's all in caps. King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And as the Hallelujah Course says, he's come to reign. He's come to reign forevermore. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Adding to the Bible there, you know. <clears throat> but it's going to be a great event. So... This is what the scripture teaches, and that's why it says to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And I've often wondered about that passage. Does this mean to pray for the return of Christ? Because we know that Jerusalem's not going to have much peace, but nevertheless, it says pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And in the meantime, we're looking to see the events that are taking place Middle in Israel, especially in the last few months. And with that, I'm out of here. So uh, will you be taken at the rapture? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for Scripture that gives us this overview of Scripture, and it gives us confidence about the present, knowing that even though Israel today, for example, is is in dire straits, and it doesn't look good. But we know that you are going to come out and fight for them, and we know that you are going to, that eventually the Antichrist will come out of Europe, revived Roman Empire, and that the seven-year tribulation will take place, and you will come back in victory over that, and for a millennial kingdom, which is a warm-up for eternity in the new heavens and new earth. And we just thank you that as a believer, we have such a wonderful plan for our lives, regardless of how much persecution or put, being put down in this life may be. And so give us courage to stand for you and to preach your gospel, because time is short. In Christ's name we pray.
Thank you, Tommy, so much. Looking forward to hearing your answers to all the questions this evening. And as you leave today, take one of those cards and fill out your questions and leave it there at the table. We'll uh, be sure and give it to the guys tonight. Did you know that well, when I was studying, not studying, somebody sent me some material about the eclipse that's supposed to take place on April 8th? It, it's, it's going over a number of different towns by the name of Nineveh. And there was one town in southern Indiana. It's, I didn't even know it existed. It's called Rapture, Indiana. <laughs> Did you know there's a Rapture, Indiana? So if you want to be a part of the Rapture, make sure you go to Rapture, Indiana. I <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It's just a little above Evansville. I know that. <laughs> so, uh, also, this conference is uh, wonderful, and we have uh, hundreds of viewers on live stream. In fact, Tommy, you had how many was he? 700? 400? I can't. Anyway, during this session. It's interesting, and we have uh, two, two chur- at least two churches having a little uh, gathering at their churches. Uh, in, one in Missouri and I think one in Oregon that uh, are, are watching us. So God bless you there. So praise the Lord for technology. The last time we had Dr. Lutzer here, we hit, he hit like 20,000 and then more than thousands more since then. Of course, you can see it later, later on, the viewers. But uh, praise the Lord. Father, thank you for this wonderful day. It's gone by really, really fast. For those who can't return tonight, who have to uh, go to their homes, we pray for your traveling graces upon them and bless them. Uh, For those of us who are going to gather here this evening, we just pray that you bless Tom and and Tommy tonight as they answer our questions. In Jesus' name, amen. We'll see you after dinner at 7 o'clock.